Isle of beauty, Isle of splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gifts so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills, and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy land, so like all fountains, giving chair that warms the soul. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite Father Eustace Thomas to come to lead us in the opening prayer and invocation. Father Thomas. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to share these words, this prayer, both in Amite, in Creole, and in English. Uno se pere difícil es en esprit. Amen. Dieu éternel et tout puissant, au soir, quand nous approchons la célébration du 10e anniversaire de l'indépendance d'Omnic, quand une nation composte investité. Global West Indies, et puis division culturelle pour 8e Lexi Memorial Annuel et au Liban. Mais nous ici à pour réfléchir à si hard national non. C'est le dixième. Nous avons pu dire au monsieur pour autorisation au cabinet docteur Kimon Joseph qui nous mettait en charge pour diriger un moment l'histoire nous. Et pour choisir Dominicien qui ni Sevel, Wadi, Eileen Borton, Raymond Lawrence, Dilia Coffee Weeks, et puis Madame Lorraine Vanessa Roberts, comme Odi Watella, pour Bano y ont meilleure compréhension des différents gammes habillement national. Bénissez-moi nous cela pour y Bano conviction comme que nous qui aimons pays nous et si nous qui enjouis habillé en habillement national non pas seulement pendant ces temps là mais même après indépendance béni aussi ces monde là qui organisait l'exercice ça là et voyez la grâce à ces tout ces monde là qui qui écoutait grâce à différents moyens de communication sociale par éternel et culturel par excellence couyaté et par par l'amour tout trois on se voit nous car souhaiter bienvenue et puis j'ai outé respect première femme présidente nous hors territoire Kalinago son excellence madame Sylvane Borton et puis mari monsieur Gilbert Borton tant pis s'il vous plaît protégez vous délivrez vous hors de tout le monde qui est mauvais hors de menaces en plus des pouvoirs nous qui a sorti hors de mauvais sujet ici à et puis toi nous commandons, mettez lui l'option à s'y assembler ça là. Comme ça, nous, nous qui écoutons des discussions, nous qui changer la mentalité, nous, en telle façon que nous qui développer plus l'amour pour qu'il tienne nous, et puis habillement national, nous, et développer un meilleur sens national, et puis respect authentique pour yon et l'autre. Nous commandons, Fabé ça là, par Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur, avec Maman la Vierge là. Maman et le pouvoir de l'Esprit, il y a un seul bon Dieu pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, the power and the glory.
forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, this evening as you approach the celebration of the 45th anniversary of independence of Dominica as a nation, the University of the West and its global campus and the Division of Culture, on this 10th annual Yo Le Blanc Memorial Lecture, have brought us here to reflect on our national wear. We pray and thank you for empowering Dr. Kimon Joseph, who was chosen to head our campus at this particular moment of our history by choosing competent Dominicans like Mrs. Aileen Burton, Raymond Lawrence, and Delia Coffey Weeks, together with Mrs. Lorraine Bannis Roberts as moderator, to enable us to better appreciate the various genres of our national attire. Give your blessings to those individuals that they may convince us of how we can be patriotic by enjoying our national outfits, not only during this time of year, but beyond the independence celebrations. Bless the organizers of this lecture, together with those who are listening to the various forms of the media. O oh, heavenly and cultural father by excellence, creator and love of all races, this evening, we welcome with gladness and respect our first female president from the Kalinago territory, Her Excellency Mrs. Sylvanie Burton, and her husband Mr. Gilbert Burton. Protect and deliver them from fear, wickedness, and all powers of darkness. And now we ask you to anoint this gathering so that by listening to our panelists, we may change our mentality by acquiring more love for our culture, our national wear, and the development of a greater sense of patriotism with a genuine respect for one another. We ask this to our Lord and Mary, to our Lord and Mary, his mother, together with the power of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may have your seats. Your Excellency, Mrs. Silvani Burton, the President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton, Mr. Olson Matthew, there he is, Chief Cultural Officer of the Division of Culture and the staff of the Division of Culture, Monsignor Eustace Thomas, priest of Our Lady of Fairhaven Parish, our panelists, Mr. Raymond Lawrence, Ms. Aileen Burton, as well as our moderator, Mrs. Lauren Bannis Roberts, our third panelist is not physically here with us, but she has done her presentation via video, and that is Mrs. Delia Coffee Weeks. Audience members in the auditorium and those joining us live via DBS radio and live streaming, media representatives, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you all. And welcome to our 10th annual Eoli Bla Memorial Lecture. This year, our theme is the National Wheel. I am charged in addition to chairing, oh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Dr. Kimon Joseph, and I'm head at UWI Global Campus. I am charged in addition to chairing this evening to also give the welcome remarks, so I will do so at this time. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to the 10th annual Eoli Bla Memorial Lecture. In some ways, I feel like I have come full circle because I was at the initial meeting for the planning of the series between Dr. Francis Severe, our global campus principal, who was then the head at the Dominica site, and Mr. Raymond Lawrence, who was the chief cultural officer at the Division of Culture at the time. So while Mr. Raymond Lawrence was a founding partner and planner of the event, he's now one of our panelists presenting this evening. So welcome, Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> when Severe, Lawrence, and I held that meeting in April of 2012, 
we wanted to include a lecture series as part of the calendar of independence activities, and we wanted it to focus on the themes of culture and heritage preservation. There was no debate as to who the series should be named after. Eoli Bla, who throughout his life had been adamant that our cultural heritage should be preserved and enjoyed. Under the current leadership of Mr. Olson Matthew, we agreed on a change from the broad cultural topics to those that were more focused on the theme of History Week each year. Our first presentation was facilitated by Dr. Alwyn Bully of Blessed Memory, who spoke on the topic, The Gilded Mango, Culture, Livelihoods, and Development in Dominica from 1950 to 2012. In 2013, Dr. Lennox Honey Church presented on the topic, Eoli Bla and the Creation of Nationalist History. In 2014, Justice Dr. Irvin Andre discussed the theme, Eoli Bla, a rendezvous with history. In 2015, Professor Emerita Hazel Simmons McDonald spoke on the topic, Cultivating Caribbean Identities, Language, Culture, and the Politics of Deprivation. Mr. Vladimir Lucien delivered the lecture in 2016 under the theme, Folk Songs Have No Authors, Creative Force and the Individual Talent in Caribbean Arts and Culture. The 2017 installment of the lecture was canceled because of Hurricane Maria. Dr. Honeychurch gladly accepted our invitation and presented on resilience and traditional architecture and heritage sites of Dominica in 2018 and 2019, respectively. In 2020, Honorable Alex Boyd Knights, also of blessed memory, presented on the topic, traditional cuisine. The COVID pandemic threw us off with our plans for 2021, but we were able to return last year and we organized that segment of the series as a panel discussion. Our topic was, Herbal Traditions, and we had presentations from Mr. Reynold Parker Deja, Mrs. Natalie Sister Nats Charles, Dr. Martha Augustus, and Ms. Terry Henry. This year, the topic for History Week is the National Wear, and we have decided to again focus on a panel discussion. The National Wear is a topic that never goes out of style pun intended. <laughs> Since I am an aspiring farm quail myself, I adore the national wear. Of course, I'm not sure I will ever reach the levels of Mrs. Weeks, Miss Akpa, Miss Aileen, Miss Pearl, and Miss Kate. Mm -mm. They have a doctorate in national wear and contemporary quail styles, and I, I can't reach that. I have miles to go, but, but I can dream, right? I can dream. The way people dress, much like the foods that they eat, their language, the music they listen to and play, and the stories that they tell, all these form part of that unique woven tapestry that creates cultural heritage. In many ways, and for obvious reasons, there are similarities between the national wear of the Caribbean islands. Yet, there are traits that make Dominica's national wear Dominica's national wear. And this evening, we will hear from three experts in cultural heritage. Mr. Raymond Lawrence, from his topic, Wearing Culture, the progression of the national wear as part of cultural celebrations, will highlight several key strategies that have been employed by the Division of Culture and other cultural enthusiasts over the years in order to showcase Dominica's national wear and to give it the prominence it deserves in our national celebrations. Then, in her presentation, Ms. Ellen Burton will speak on the topic, A Glimpse of History, the Evolution of Dominica's Creole Wear. Ms. Burton will show some of the intricacies that make Dominica's national wear truly unique as she gives the historical context of the garments. Finally, we will hear from Mrs. Delia Coffee Weeks, who is traveling and so is not physically with us this evening. She has prepared her presentation via video recording and the presentation is entitled Beyond October. 
blending the national will into contemporary lifestyles. Our panel discussion tonight will be moderated by Mrs. Lauren Panis Roberts, who is the former Minister of Culture, and we are grateful to her for accepting our invitation. We at the UWI Global Campus thank the Cultural Division, who have been working with us for the past 10 years to ensure that this series is executed as part of the independence celebrations each year. Olson, like we did with Raymond and with Jacinta of Blessed Memory, UWI recommits its relationship that we have established with the Cultural Division. You and your staff have our full support, and we are grateful for the collaborations we have engaged in, both during independence and emancipation celebrations. Like you, our staff is young, but experienced and professional. I have no doubt that we can continue to work together long into the future. Ms. Annalyn Joseph is our guild president, and she is scheduled to give the vote of thanks. But I do want to give some highlights as I have the floor. Madam President Burton and Mr. Burton, it is a delight to have you with us this evening. The patronage of the President of the Commonwealth of Dominica has always been welcomed at UWI events. And we regretted that the pandemic halted some of that for a few years. However, we welcome you here in hopes that this will be the first of many UWI activities for the two of you. In addition, I am grateful to my own staff, Barry, Clarissa, Javid, Kidisha, Brittany, Lisa, Alex, Catherine, Lincoln, Coulson, and Jason for their continued support in this and other activities and events. I'm also grateful for the support of the executive members of Dominica's chapter of the UE Guild of Students, as well as the Alumni Association, who are both on board for this particular project. I'm also grateful for the collaborative support from DBS Radio, who is carrying this event live, free of charge. Thank you so much, DBS. Yes, you can clap for DBS. <laughs> time and time again, DBS has proven to be a good friend to UWI. The support has been unwavering, and for this, I'm very grateful. Cecil, wherever you are tonight, I appreciate you. On behalf of the University of the West Indies, and in particular, the staff and students of the Dominica site. I welcome everyone to the event this evening and I anticipate a wonderful presentation and lively discussions afterwards. Good evening to everyone and all the best to our presenters. So when my friends saw that um, there was a moderator. They said, oh, good, for once you can sit with us. I said, no, I'm chairing, you know. I'm not moderating, but I'm chairing. <laughs> so I cannot sit with you. Um, but I would like to thank Mrs. Um, Banish Roberts for agreeing to be our moderator this evening. And to welcome her to the podium, I invite Ms. Kisha Polidor, who is a graduate student representative on the UE Global Campus Guild of Students, the Dominica chapter. I welcome Kisha to come and introduce our moderator to us. Do I skipped Olson? So she's trying to tell me that desperately, you know. Sorry, I skipped Olson. How can I skip Olson? So before we do that, we have remarks from Mr. Olson Matthew, who is the chief cultural officer. Akisha is trying to tell me that. <laughs> I invite Mr. Olson Matthew, who is the chief, chief cultural officer, to give the collaborators remarks before we have the moderator. <laughs> Thank you, Kimon. <laughs> now I know where I stand. <laughs> Your Excellency, Mrs. Silvani Burton, President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton. Dr. Kimon Joseph, <laughs> Head of UE Global Campus and staff of the UE Global Campus. Monsignor Eustace Thomas, priest at Our Lady of Fairhaven Parish. All panelists, Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Aileen Burton, Delia Coffee-Wicks, and moderator, Mrs. Lauren Bannis roberts Audience members, viewers, listeners, invited guests, good evening and welcome to this year's EU Libla Memorial Lecture, 
with the focus being the national wear. The goal is to clear up many of the misconceptions that may exist and build our personal knowledge, which in turn we can continue to share. Don't be surprised if this is a recurring theme. There's clearly the need for constant reinforcement. Tonight, we will call on the expertise of some of the most credible knowledge bearers on the subject. In fact, we at the division have reached out to them internally on the same topic in the past for our own development. And the focus might be a bit heavy on the warp do yet itself, but we must also be mindful that the national wear applies to men and women in both the formal and informal variations. We continue to applaud all of the initiatives that seek to promote and preserve the national wear, such as fashion shows, private sector initiatives, publications, and other personal endeavors. And while we continue to provide avenues for inventiveness with the use of creative Creole wear on days like tomorrow, we also dream of a time when the masses will carry their national wear with pride in its correct state without being prompted. As you know, the cultural division hosts two staple pageants during the independence season, with variations that have included males in the past. Additionally, we stage district competitions that feature both the national wear and creative Creole wear in the Jinping Rong dances. Our national dress parade also presents an opportunity to highlight the national wear. Our goal is to effectively uphold the integrity of these events and as a result, we are constantly asked, is any warp do at the national wear? On what occasions is it not mandatory to use the national wear? What constitutes the national wear? And we're talking about fabric, the design, the color of the fabric, the cut, the headpiece, and other accessories. What is creative Creole wear, and how does it compare to our national wear? Am I wearing the national wear at the moment? All right, all you waiting for me. <laughs> Another question that they ask, which traditional dances require the full national wear? Do you all know? Hmm? Okay, so I'll learn something tonight. <laughs> and many other questions that some may be afraid to ask at the risk of seemingly um, lacking common knowledge or may not just um, care just not to ask altogether and proceed to do whatever feels right to them. We would love to see better. But who spearheads the movement and who does the public model after? The seniors with their unwavering passion? Other enthusiasts? And it's also easy to say, but all this cultural division, so you, and rightfully so. But we still call on influencers that the public actually look towards for direction. Like everything else culture related, everyone is expected to play their part. More and more you can see how deep this topic is. So tonight's goal is for these matters to be addressed, and we will all live with a better understanding, a common understanding. I look forward to the presentations and discussions. And from the faces present, it might appear that we're preaching to the choir once more, but it needs to be done nonetheless. As far as independence goes, remember that there are still many activities to come for the season. For example, this weekend we will host cultural finals one, two, and three, at the Old Mill, Pierre Charles Secondary School, and the Cabritz National Park, respectively. Next week is National Emblems Week, starting with Flag Day on Monday. Let me commend the National Emblems Committee on the recently relaunched Symbols of Nationhood um, publication. Heritage Day will be at Woodford Hill on the 22nd. Of course, the pageants that I mentioned earlier and the National Dress Parade, Had Quay All Fridays, Cultural Gala, and so much more. So, anu celebrate, kawat sek nani ade padas. Me yoswea nukaya pwad kot had national Dominic. Messi. Thank you very much, Wilson. And now it is time for us to introduce the moderator. So I ask Ms. Keisha Polidor, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a graduate student representative at the UWI Global Campus Guild of Students, to do the honor of introducing Mrs. Lauren Banis Roberts. Keisha? Your Excellency, Mrs. Silvani Burton, President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton. 
Dr. Kimon Joseph, head, UWE Global Campus and staff of the UWE Global Campus. Mr. Olson Matthew, Chief Cultural Officer, Division of Culture and Staff of the Division of Culture, Monsignor, Monsignor Eustace Thomas, Priest, Our Lady of Fairhaven Parish. Our panelists, Mr. Raymond Lawrence, Ms. Aileen Burton, as well as our moderator, Mrs. Lauren Barnes Roberts, audience members in the auditorium, and those viewing us via DBS Radio. Good night. Mrs. Lauren Ruth Barnes Roberts, is a former ambassador of Dominica to the United Nations. She is a community leader, cultural activist, and athlete. Lauren served as parliament representative of the Casabros constituency for two consecutive terms from 2000 to 2009. During her tenure in active politics, Lauren served as parliamentary secretary to in the Ministry of Education and Sports, minister in the office of the prime minister, and the Minister of Community Development, Culture, Gender Affairs, and Information. Among her numerous cultural projects, Lauren was the coordinator of the Casabrus Family and Friends Reunion in 2000. Also, she assisted numerous community and cultural groups in their participation in cultural exchanges and similar events in Miami and Houston. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mrs. Silvani Burton, President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton, Senator, the Honorable Austin Lockhart, Dr. Kimon Joseph, Head of UE Global Campus, Dominica, Monsignor Eustace Thomas, Priest at the Lady of, of, uh, at the Lady of Fairhaven Parish, Mr. Olson Matthew, Acting Chief Cultural Officer, Staff of the Cultural Division, Panelists, Mr. Raymond Lawrence, Ms. Aileen Burton, and Mrs. Delia Coffey Wicks, Ms. Keisha Polido, Graduate Student Representative, UWE Global Campus, Guild of Students, Dominica Chapter, Ms. Annalyn Joseph, Chair, UWE Global, Global Campus, Guild Students, Dominica Chapter, Ms. Tasha P, Cultural Officer. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good evening. I must recognize my good friend, Anita Bully. <laughs> it is truly an honor and a privilege to have been invited by the University of the West Indies, Global Campus Dominica, to host the 10th annual E. Blanc Lecture Series. I congratulate UWE Global Campus Dominica and the Division of Culture for collaborating in what I consider an essential aspect of our rich cultural heritage, a heritage we should preserve at all costs. As a cultural enthusiast who wears and promotes our national wear, this evening is truly an exciting event for me personally. Dominica's culture is simply, simply part of my DNA. It was inescapable as my mother, Rufina Banis, a cultural icon in the Casabras community and the East, actively organized and promoted cultural activities in and out of season. She formed and managed her own cultural group, the Weekend Dancers. She owned many traditional instruments. She was the proprietor of her own entertainment venue. She would ensure that the members of her group wore authentic traditional wear for competition as well as entertainment purposes. It was no mystery that when I walked down the aisle 25 years ago, on October 31st, 1998, I was fully adorned with my complete national wear, and so was my bridal party. I am confident that the attire of the entire bridal party was among Mrs. Louisa Binois' best work. 
our panelists. Incidentally, the dread that I'm wearing on the headpiece tonight, they were created by Mrs. Louisa Binoa. Our panelists tonight consist of cultural enthusiasts who are all quite capable of presenting on our theme, Dominica's National Wear. Mr. Raymond Lawrence will deliver on wearing culture, the progression of the national wear as part of our cultural celebrations. Ms. Aileen Burton, a glimpse of history, the evolution of Dominica's national wear. Mrs. Delia Coffee Weeks, beyond October, blending the national wear into contemporary lifestyles. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, Allow me to introduce our first contributor to this evening's 10th annual EO Libla lecture series. And our first presenter is none other than my very good friend, Mr. Raymond Lawrence. I have known Mr. Raymond Lawrence for <laughs> a lifetime, <laughs> and he is my very good friend. It's a pleasure, Raymond, to introduce you tonight. So Mr. Raymond Lawrence is a retired chief cultural officer. At present, he is the chair of the National Emblems Committee and the Committee Poetit Creole. Raymond holds a master's degree in mass communications and culture from the University of North Texas, a bachelor's degree from the University of Steubenville in Ohio, and a certificate in management studies from the UE Mona. Raymond worked with Dominica's Division of Culture for 36 years. He was also the chair of the National Cultural Council and chair of Dominica's Independent Celebration Committee for many years. Raymond and I worked, in fact, I was minister when we had reunion 2008, yeah, yeah. and it was a blast, right? Yeah. Good, so we've collaborated before. Raymond has been involved in the development of arts and culture for the past 54 years. He's an actor, dancer, choreographer, artist, short story writer and poet, show organizer, and cultural activist. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our very own Mr. Raymond Lawrence. Thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator, my former Minister for Culture at one time. <laughs> Let me take the opportunity to recognize Your Excellency, the President, of Dominica, Mrs. Sylvani Burton and Mr. Gilbert Burton. Dr. Kimon Joseph, the head of the UE Global Campus. The acting chief cultural officer, Wilson Matthew, and the staff of the Cultural Division. A moderator, I also acknowledge you as well, Mrs. Laureen Banis Roberts. It's so good to see you again. Uh, my other speaker here this evening, Aileen Burton. Well, Delia Coffey is out of state, but we'll see her video recording. Invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Bonsoir, tout le monde. The independent celebration has begun, and tonight I think we are celebrating national wear. So I thank Dr. Joseph, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this 10th E.O. Leblanc Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph. I would like to start off by saying that I'm speaking about my experience with National Wear during the time that I served as Chief Cultural Officer and also during my experience before I was Chief Cultural Officer and even before I joined the Cultural Division. Also, I will speak to what we have now come to know and accept as our national wear, because what we refer to as our national wear today has become such an integral and important part of our culture and heritage in Dominica. We have come to adopt and accept the Wabduyet, the Jeep, 
and the male national wear as Dominica's national wear. I've heard our Wab Juliet also referred to as Wab Creole or Wab Creole as Creole dress, Gua Wab Dudu Matador, and Wab Nacional. So during the course of our history, we have had various terms which have described the Wab Duet. My earliest recollections of our national wear go back to the 1950s when I was a little boy and my eldest sister, Zilla, belonged to a group led by the late Mabel C.C. Corderon and the group was called the Kyrie Artistic Troupe. With this group, Mrs. Corderon promoted the Wab Duet and the Jeep. She promoted Dominica's folk creole songs. She composed many folk songs herself and in so doing helped to promote our creole language in a time when the creole language was frowned upon, and she also promoted the folk dances of Dominica. Mrs. Cordero had a deep passion and love for the folk culture of Dominica, and it became one of her life's missions to promote these various aspects of our Creole culture, the Creole language, the folk music, the folk dances, and our Creole wear. She would also organize carnival bands of girls dressed up in jeep and ladies in Wab Duet. In those days, another lady in Roseau who would take a lot of pride in wearing her Wab Duet was Irene Peltier, who lived on Cork Street, close to where Aileen Burton grew up. When the National Day celebrations were introduced in 1965, Mrs. Corderon assisted the late E. O. Leblanc with planning and organizing the celebrations. I remember her as well preparing well over a hundred girls to do displays at the Botanic Gardens, dressed in jeep costumes, and also to welcome Prince Philip at the Bayfront on one of his visits to Dominica. And even in the midst of her promotion of Dominica's Creole expressions, she would lament the fact that not enough of the ladies were showing an appreciation or an interest in wearing the Wab Duet. So she composed a song which is still popular with us today and some of the lyrics go like this. Sa sa ye sa, se ti fila, pa konet sa, pa eme, Wab Duet ma she. Sa sa ye sa, se ti fila, vle kite Wab Duet la dispawet. And she goes on to say, Bel Wab Nula, Bel Jip Nula, Bel Zano Shenu, Bel Kol Yeshu, Pa Mem Sio Wesam de Gua Wive, Se Tifila Ka Abie. I should get pulled to sing that for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> In those days, Mrs. Coderon wrote an article about the Creole dress of Dominica. In it, she writes, whether they realize it or not, whether our girls have ever faced the fact at all, one thing is absolutely certain, and it's this, that the fate of our native dress lies in their hands. She went on to say, while it behoves us, the older generation, to do as we were done by and pass on to them what our old folks passed on to us, namely the history of our Creole dress with all its color, its charm, and its elegance. I remember Mrs. Corderon herself dressed up in either Wab Duet or Jeep for various events. She would use these outfits for certain formal occasions as well. I saw a picture of her meeting Dr. Eric Williams, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago at the time. Mrs. Corderon was dressed up in her Wab Duet for that special occasion which took place in Trinidad. In the 1960s, another sister of mine, Jean Lawrence, started a well-known choral group called the Sifla Motain Chorale. I remember that group also using the jeep and the Wab Duet and the men's national wear for their performances on certain occasions, late 1960s into the 1970s. Jean composed many, many folk songs, but she also composed a song which specifically speaks to the Wab Duet 
and Jeep. In the song, she sings, Écoutez-moi, fille et femme Dominique. Écoutez bien, ça m'a qu'à dire. M'a qu'à lui dire, yon ke choye. Où est-ce que tu es là? Ibel. Est-ce que tu es Jeep là? Ibel. Où est-ce que tu es là? C'est ça, non. Toute femme Dominique, toute fille Dominique, si pose ni la wop national. Songs like this one were created to inspire, especially the young generation, to use and promote the national wear of Dominica. The wop duet dress became a featured part of what was called the National Day Queen competition, which was introduced in the 1960s and 1970s at the Arawak Cinema, as it was called at the time. Unfortunately, the show was discontinued in the 1970s, and then there was a bit of a hiatus before the cultural vision introduced what we now know as the Miss Wabduyat show in 1982. I remember when I joined the cultural vision with Alwyn and Pearl, I brought up the idea of introducing a Wabduyat show. The idea was accepted, and the first Wabduyat show was staged that same year during the independence, the first winner was Sandra Charter Roll. First runner up was Talifa Charles from La Plaine. The categories in those days were just talent and Wob Duet. The Wob Duet show has continued to be a success story, and it is my understanding that the Wob Duet show is the only one of its kind in all of the Creole speaking countries in the world. So that should be a feather in Dominica's cap. The cultural vision took a decision to provide the contestants with their Wob Duet outfits. So when I think back on it, the division invested very heavily in the making of Wob Duet dresses for all of the contestants since 1982. So we're talking about 41 years. And I want to mention the assistance of Pearl Christian in a special way. Pearl coordinated the making of those warp duets in those days and, and the petticoats by getting the material, following up with the seamstresses. So Pearl, thanks a lot for your contribution to the warp duets show. <laughs> there were twice in the history of the competition when we decided to do a Creole couple competition to give the men a chance as well. And that show, too, was very successful. The male winners won the title of Mr. Creole, and the female winners won the title of Miss Wab Duet for those competitions. In fact, one of the winners of that competition is here with us tonight, Mikhail Ferrov, <laughs> who is back in Dominica. <laughs> the Madame Wab was introduced in the 1990s by Vina McDougall. I distinctly remember her telling me that the Wab Duet show was for the younger ladies, but we needed a show for the more senior ladies. So she came up with the idea of the Madame Wab, geared at more senior women, and the show was also a success during the 10 years or so that she was able to stage it. But then there was a hiatus of about 10 to 11 years during which the show was not staged at all. So then it was about 2011 when I called Vina in my capacity as Chief Cultural Officer and asked her about the status of the show. And I told her that the Cultural Division was interested in reviving the show. And I asked for her permission for us to stage the show and she agreed. So we went ahead, we organized the show, and up to today, the Madame Wab Duet show has continued to be a success. The Tea Matador show for the children was organized by Jacinta David and the Performing Arts Workshop. Before the introduction of the Tea Matador event, the Roseau Cultural Group, headed by Aileen Burton, had introduced and was organizing the Fet Tea Doo Doo in the 1990s which featured very small children around the ages of four to nine or so. The purpose of the event was to promote the wear among children. That event was held for some years, 
And then the Tea Matador event was introduced in 2004. The first winner was a student from the St. Luke's Primary School. The Tea Matador competition, of course, is held between the students of the primary schools in Dominica. And while it was not held for a few years, the good news is that it is now being revived. When it comes to the men, the male national wear appears to date back to the 1950s and 1960s, during the time that Mrs. Corderon had her Kyrie artistic troupe. I did a bit of research on the national wear as well, and in the case of the men, it seems Mrs. Corderon is, is the one who introduced the basic outfit for the men, which is the long sleeve white shirt, the black pants, and the red sash. So the folk groups across Dominica started to adopt and include the male national wear in their performances during the National Day celebrations and independence celebrations. And after some years, one began to see some of the Jinping players and some of the folk groups adding the Madras waistcoat to the male national wear. And in the early 1990s, when I became chief cultural officer, we were able to introduce the jacket for the men based on the influence of the paintings of Agostino Brunias, which showed the freed African males using jackets. We also introduced the Madras band of cloth over one shoulder, and that too has become a Creole feature um, for the men, especially during the folk competitions. And when we staged the Creole couple competition, which I mentioned earlier, the men wore the Creole jacket to accompany the ladies in their more formal Wabduyet appearance. What is being used today by men more and more is the casual madras shirt, which falls over the pants. But the real male national wear comprises the white shirt, black pants, and red sash which is the basic outfit. This can also be worn with a madras waistcoat to make it a little more formal, and a madras jacket can also be worn for even more formal occasions. One of the events which has served as a catalyst for the wearing of Creole wear in Dominica has been Creole Day, without a doubt. Creole Day was first, or Jeune Creole, was first observed in Dominica in 1984. The Comité Poétique Creole Keck and the Cultural Division with Alwyn Bully as Chief Cultural Officer at the time came up with the idea of Creole Day and also Heritage Day to form part of our independence celebrations. Creole Day is observed on the last Friday of October every year. When Creole Day was introduced, all Dominicans were asked to dress up in Creole wear. But the response to the dressing up on that day was slow at first. But then it started to pick up momentum. And then more and more people started wearing the Creole wear on that day. I remember Pearl saying that in those first days it was like she alone had on the Creole wear. <laughs> <laughs> on Creole day. But look at the difference between then and now. The cultural vision then started encouraging schools and also business places and government offices to encourage their staff members to wear cruel wear. And then I think is when the cruel wear just took off and bloomed and blossomed into the beautiful expression that we have these years on Creole Day. And through the years, we have seen island-wide participation in Creole Day activities among the schools, the private and public sectors, and the public at large. Visitors to Dominica during the Creole season have been heard to say that they have never before seen any other country dress up in their national wear in the way Dominicans dress up in our national wear on Creole Day. And that is, uh, I think, another plus for Dominica. During Heritage Day, the singing of Creole songs and the wearing of Creole wear was encouraged, and the church services on that day became very much alive and vibrant, with churchgoers dressed in their national wear and singing Creole songs. The same thing still happens today. 
Now we are seeing that from the start of the independence, at the National Day of Prayer Service, Dominicans wearing their national wear and are beginning to put on their Creole wear on the other Sundays during the Creole month of October. The cultural division in the 1990s also took a decision and stipulated that the folk dance groups in Dominica should wear the wabduyette for the quadrille especially and that they could use the jeep for the other folk dances. That was another way of ensuring that both the wabduyette and the jeep would be promoted during our independence celebrations. Through the years as well, ministers of government, prime ministers, presidents, and their spouses were also to be seen wearing the national wear of Dominica. One will remember the late Eugenia Charles, while she was prime minister, wearing her wabduyet to official functions. Also, prime ministers like Pierre Charles and Edison James promoted the men's national wear while in office, and the current Prime Minister, Roosevelt Skerritt, also wears his national wear on occasions. And during the National Day ceremonies in particular, it's always encouraging to see ministers of government and other officials dressed up in Dominica's Creole wear. I should add that it was also very pleasing to see our new president, Her Excellency Sylvani Burton, who was sworn in last week, Monday, October the 2nd, dressed up in her full wabdriat in all its splendor at her swearing-in ceremony. And tonight, she has on another national wear outfit, the jeep, in all its splendor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and congrats on your new position. In the early 1990s, I remember Aileen joining Cultural Vision. And among her work accomplishments, Aileen did research on the national dress of Dominica and was able to write and produce a book on Dominica's national dress. We applied to UNESCO at the time to fund the printing of the book, and UNESCO approved the project, and the book on the national dress of Dominica was printed. A wonderful achievement for Aileen and the Cultural Vision, and also a wonderful resource and reference book for all Dominicans who need information on our national dress. Aileen recently published two books for children featuring the Wab Duet and the other featuring the ship. She used storytelling in the both books to bring across the message of the importance of appreciating and promoting our national wear. We congratulate Aileen on her personal efforts to promote and preserve Dominica's national wear, and tonight she will be speaking on the topic as well. <laughs> I must speak about the work of overseas Dominicans, so we refer to them as the diaspora sometimes, <laughs> in promoting our national wear. I think these days they're going all out to promote Dominica's national wear. Through the years, we have seen Dominican associations such as in New York, New Jersey, Toronto, England, you all will know other places as well, St. Thomas, planning and organizing their own Wab Duet shows, including Miss Wab Duet, Madame Wab Duet, and also T. Matador. As we say in Dominica, give them room. <laughs> Make space, make space for them, right? <laughs> and you know, there are other um, cities like Miami, Houston, we mentioned um, islands like St. Thomas, also St. Martin, Antigua, yeah, New Jersey. And even if they don't have competitions, but they have Creole gatherings and activities that showcase Dominica's national way. When I look at those pictures and videos, I am very heartened and encouraged. And I say, wait a while now, these people are beating our ear, <laughs> you know. I mean, they're really putting their best foot forward for Dominica and representing the country very, very well. And it is, in fact, still growing and expanding. 
We have seen our national wear being used and promoted at regional and international festivals, such as at the various Cary Festas and World Expos, such as the one held in Vancouver, Canada in 1986, and the World Expo in Dubai in 2021. Dominica's delegations have also promoted our national wear at events such as the Olympic events. I think all of these expressions of our culture help to demonstrate that we, as a people, are continuing to show that we are indeed proud of our culture and our national wear. I want you to mention and, and touch on the subject of Madras in, in, sort of in general. Um, because sometimes there's a little bit of a tension developing between sometimes Madras or not Madras. But I think we have reached a stage in Dominica where we have come to embrace Madras, among other uh, prints, as a very important part of our heritage and that we need to continue to embrace the Madras as part of our heritage. So I don't think there should be any tension in the air surrounding Madras. While Madras came to us originally from India, but through Africa and Africans, we have been using Madras for hundreds of years here in Dominica, especially with the women's head ties and with skirts. And now we are seeing Madras being used occasionally for Wab Duyat, like um, Lauren Banis Roberts here tonight in the Jeep, like His, Her Excellency the President. And I want to say that, of course, we can use other types of material. That's fine for Wab Duyat, like flowered, like what um, Simon, Kimon has on, dotted, checkered, striped, because they all make beautiful Wab Duyats, you know? But I think if somebody would like, a, a, let's say, a Wab Duyat in Madras, personally, I don't have, or a jeep, um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't see a problem with that. Um, because it has been such, and Madras has been such an integral part of our heritage, and I find even more so to me every year, it is becoming in, more increasingly popular. And I want to quote from an article by C.C. Cordero, who said, when the Madras replaced the white headkerchief, Creole women began to use this pliable material for their pleated foulards. I didn't realize that they were using Madras for fullers as well, and even for the Egypts, that's Mrs. Cordero writing. So it looks like they were using Madras way back when. Um, so through the years, we've seen many women using Madras uh, for their Wab duets, some of them. And as I said, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it helps identify us as a Creole and Dominican people. In the case of the male national wear, the men use madras for all our waistcoats, bands over the shoulder, creole shirts, our jackets. Madras is also the main cloth for decoration during our creole season of independence. I think right now in Dominica, when you walk the streets or enter business places or government offices, you see madras right away. You feel and experience the spirit of creole and our independence celebration. So I think that in the case of Wab Duet, of course we can continue to use all other options, which are beautiful, the floral, the dotted, the striped, etc. And we should promote all the other options, nothing wrong with that. But I think that in addition, uh, there's not a problem, I think, with using Madras as it has become such an integral part of our culture. And we've seen pioneers like Mrs. Cordero, Jean Lawrence, Matthew, and Sonia Lloyd using Madras at one point or the other. Also, when you look at the region, I have seen Madras being used in Guadeloupe, Martinique, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Antigua, Montserrat, and Suriname. And I'm sure that's not the full list. So you can see there is a similarity in the heritage and the influences of Madras in the Caribbean. So it came to the Caribbean, and it seems the whole Caribbean fall in love with Madras. That's what it looks like to me, because it has become such an integral part of our heritage. And this is my personal view on the matter. And while we're on the topic of Madras, one of the headpieces which I think we should revive is one with the peaks. We used to call them peaks, um, one peak, two peak, three peak. 
those were the head ties I used to see women wear when I was younger. I see in Lennox Honey Church's book, The Island Culture, where Lennox <laughs> created illustrations of the headpieces with peaks and refers to the peaks as piton, yon piton, des piton, trois piton. Trois piton? <laughs> okay, we're not talking about the water now, okay? <laughs> There's also a meaning for the different pitons. So when a lady wore the yon piton, that's according to the illustrations in the Knox's book, or the one peak, she was saying, Chem went ouvert. My heart is open. The de piton, or the two peaks, meant Chem went pont déjà, tota. My heart is already taken. You arrive too late. And the trois piton or the three peaks meant où ça prend chance. <laughs> when you're place pour, you can take a chance. I have a place for you. Okay, so now you all can start wearing the peaks. <laughs> the ladies, what do you want to send your message? <laughs> Um, but that came with the head ties, with the peaks, which I don't see much of anymore. And I think we should revive, and I'm wondering what has happened to those head ties. <laughs> when I was growing up, I used to see many women, including Mrs. Cordero, using the ones with the peaks. My sister used to use them as well. So maybe Aileen, Delia, and other Creole enthusiasts can help to revive those head pieces as well, in addition to the many other head pieces which we are promoting. So in other words, we want to have and include as many of the influences that we have had. I also wanted to mention the economic benefits of the national web because sometimes we forget that. And the contribution to our economy because in the creation of our national web, we are engaging the services of so many seamstresses and tailors across the island. Imagine having to make cruel wear for all those school children all over. The, they have to find seamstresses somewhere, they have to find tailors somewhere, and it is creating jobs for, I would want to say, hundreds of people across the island. Also, when we purchase material at the stores, we buy the madras, we buy all kind of floral thing and so on, we are creating jobs for the people who are also working in those establishments. So sometimes we just take it for granted and we don't realize that, that those the spillover effects of just people wearing and creating and making national wear. In fact, we are creating jobs across, and every year it's happening, so which means every year people are being employed in that industry. It's something I think that is overlooked and I think we need to emphasize the importance of the contribution and benefits, economic benefits of national wear to the economy of Dominica. So what are some of the challenges we face with the promotion of our national wear? One of them, I think, is the creative outfits we see now with regards to the career wear. Now, don't get me wrong, I think persons can be creative. <laughs> Culture has always been and will always be a coexistence between traditional and contemporary. So in other words, there are times when you can have a creative outfit, but in the same way you make time for the creative outfit, you can also make time for the real warb duet. So nobody's saying you cannot be creative, but then you're spending time and money on the creative, which means you can also take some of that time and money to invest in traditional Creole wear. The concept of creative or contemporary and traditional applies not just to Creole wear, but to all areas of culture. We have all our modern and contemporary music, for instance, but we still enjoy our folk, our traditional music as well. When it comes to cuisine, we have all our creative dishes, but there are times when you feel for a good kalalu or a good smoked meat broth, or broth, as we say. So you have the modern dishes, but at the same time, you want the, the coconut cheese and the tablet and the, 
And when you go overseas, it's now you're missing all of those things. You're not missing all the modern thing, you know, is the tablet and the coconut cheese they want and the black pudding. All the traditional, that is what you're missing. Why? I don't know. But we ha that, is, that just, to show, just goes to show how it goes hand in hand. Yes, we are moving forward. Yes, we are developing. But we are taking with us all the beautiful and rich heritage experiences that we have. Even in areas such as medicine, we use modern medicine, but there are also times when we use the traditional medicine as well, the bush teas and bush medicines which our parents and grandparents used and made us use as well. And the list goes on. So in the area of Creole wear or national wear, the same contemporary and traditional concept applies. So when it comes to suggestions or recommendations in connection with the national way, I would suggest that schools, banks, business places, government offices, public at large, decide for yourselves a day or more days than one when you can use the real national wear of Dominica. You can be creative on some other days, but I would suggest that there should be a time when institutions, including schools, etc., decide on this day or days, we are going to wear the real national wear, and that is all it is. It comes down to a decision. There's a family friend of mine who says they asked them at work to dress up in Creole wear on a particular day this year, and she says she wants to put on a real wabdriette in all its full splendor. She wouldn't wear it all the time, as we know, during the season. But there are special times when she will put on the real national wear. And if we're going to help promote our national wear and keep it alive, that's all it takes, a decision to wear it at school or when we go to work on Creole Day, to church a couple of Sundays, or when we go to some functions, we wear the real national wear. I'm not saying we have to wear it all the time, but there are times when we should, and there are times when we can, and to wear it with pride and dignity. The thing is, if we do not promote it ourselves, and if we do not even want to wear it anymore, other countries will take it and run with it, as some of them are already doing. I know an island that was already taking Dominica's national wear and running with it. Another suggestion is that we continue to provide opportunities for the wearing of our national wear. That is what Creole Day was and is meant to be, wearing the real national wear. Yes, we have gone creative with it to a certain extent. And as I said, there are times when you feel like being creative and that's okay. But why not make Creole Day, as an example, a day when we wear our real national wear. And what about the 3rd of November, Independence Day itself? Why not use that opportunity to wear the real national wear of Dominica? But we, I think we can all choose a special event, not just during independence, even during the year as well, or if you're traveling overseas to some special event, why not wear the national wear at one point or the other? When cultural delegations and even other delegations travel overseas to represent Dominica, at some point in the visit, all members of the delegation can dress up in the national way of Dominica, carrying your flag, whatever it is, and be proud to really represent your country. I'm also encouraging our government officials and parliamentarians to continue to use certain occasions to wear the national way. I'm not saying all the time, all I'm saying is that at certain times, you decide to wear the authentic national wear of Dominica. Another suggestion is that every Dominican should own a national wear of his or her own, so that when certain occasions present themselves, you have the national wear to put on. Just to give an example, when I was at UE Mona, Jamaica, or at the University of Steubenville in Ohio, or at the University of North Texas in Denton, there would be times when they would have gatherings of regional, in the case of UE Mona, they would have gatherings of regional students, and at Steubenville and North Texas, international students, like an international student's day. 
and many of the students represented their home countries with their national wear at that occasion. And I was always proud. I didn't have to look for national wear. I had one. The Chinese coming with theirs, Japanese coming with theirs, India coming, just give them room, and so on. But thank God, you, we have our national wear, so we can stand up proud as well among all the countries in the world because we have a national wear. So it's important that every Dominican should own his or her own national wear. Let us not drop the ball, as we say. Let us not drop the ball. So many years of promoting that national wear has happened. So let us now, at this point in time, just say, Osa se bagay viemun, that is, you know, and whatever it is, I'm not sure. Finally, as chairman of our National Emblems Committee, we just published a revised copy of a National Emblems book entitled The Symbols of Nationhood. I can say that we are now in the process of trying to get Dominica's national wear officially recognized and approved by cabinet as a national emblem. And in that way, encourage Dominicans even more to wear our national wear on certain occasions. Ladies and gentlemen, Dominica and Dominicans have many rich aspects of cultural heritage which we should continue to cherish and appreciate and also preserve and promote. Let us not keep looking to the outside world to copy or imitate everything they do. We have our expressions of culture right here in Dominica to showcase to the world like our national way. And we should be proud of our national way as part of our culture. Because all of these rich expressions of our heritage help to build and strengthen in us our sense of nationalism, patriotism, dignity, sense of belonging and pride and help us to be able to stand up anywhere in the world and say, I am representing my country. I am proud to be a Dominican. I wish to end with a quote from one of the folk songs of one of our music legends in Dominica, Sonia Lloyd, who passed recently, who was another great and passionate promoter of our national wear. This is a song all Dominicans know, and which is played a lot at various Creole events. The title of the song is Quitte Colte la Vive. And so I quote a section of the song which says, Saki di nous passa porte duet a corps. Would that say that now, Jill? Saki di nous passa porte gipla a corps. Saki di nous passa marché comme matador. Where she get those words from? Yo. Saki di nous ka kite colte dominic mo. Ay, kite colte la viv. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a rich cultural legacy. Let us all try to keep our culture alive, colorful, and vibrant. Thank you very much. Merci au <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Raymond Lawrence, and let's give it up for him one more time. Very good presentation. I love the recommendations, and I can't wait for our open discussion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Aileen Burton. Aileen Burton. Ms. Aileen Burton is a retired nurse and midwife who was trained in the UK and at UWE. Aileen served as cultural assistant with special responsibility for research and documentation at the Division of Culture. During her tenure at the division, she was also the curator of the Arawak House of Culture and the organizer of the Parade Pour Journée Creole, Creole de Paride. Aileen is a traditional cultural activist and consultant of the traditional Creole dresses of Dominica. As a skilled specialist of Creole head ties, national wear, and Creole dances, she has facilitated many workshops. 
She is a founding member of the Roso Cultural Group. Aileen recently launched two children books, children's books that document the authentic components of the Wobdwiet and the Jeep Chemise, Dominica's national dress. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Miss Aileen Burton, and she will be presenting on the topic, A Glimpse of History, the Evolution of Dominica's Creole Wear. Miss Aileen Burton. Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Your Excellency. Mrs. Sylvani Burton, President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton. Your Excellency, may I offer my sincere congratulations on your appointment as the first female president of the Commonwealth of Dominica. I am a great believer in the potential of women and I am a great believer in the potential of women and I am always proud when women are given a traditionally male position. I anticipate the day when a woman will be made commissioner of the Dominica Police Force. Your Excellency, I was walking in town the day after you were sworn in. A lady approached me and she had a questioning look on her face. And she hesitatingly said, is this you? No. But it's you, you are the president. <laughs> of course, I had to burst her bubble of excitement. Your Excellency, as you appear more in public, Dominicans will see that I am dwarfed by your elegance, your height, and your beauty. As protocol has already been established, allow me to say a warm good evening to everyone here. I would like to begin with two quotes. Dr. Wanjiri Kamau of Kenya says, and I quote, anybody who does not have a history is a slave, end of quote. I am being the devil's advocate here, hoping that this quote will stimulate good discussion for our young scholars, because we do have a history, regardless of the fact that some see and dwell only on the negative side. The second quotation comes from our own historian, Dr. Lennox Honeychurch, who says, to know is to love is to preserve. This quote says it all. Out of the, past, the painful past, Dominica has inherited a myriad of precious Creole Métis legacies. Neither is European, totally European, or African. We are Creole, we are Métis. And one of them is dress. And I hope by the end of this panel discussion that our audience and viewers will appreciate the value of the dress and make it a patriotic duty to preserve our national Creole dresses of Dominica. We know all about the transatlantic slave trade. It was a time of war, a time of conquest, a time when Europe searched for raw material to enrich king and country. Africa had every item on the bucket list and somehow they felt they had the God-given right to invade and exploit. And so the slave trade began. 
the kernel of our history. I have with me Javid, who is going to help me with my presentation. There we are. We have slaves in shackles ready for the shipment to the islands. Okay. So the slaves were brought to the, to the islands. Dominica provided a haven for the sailors who journeyed across the Atlantic. She had an abundance of water and lush vegetation for shelter. Dominica therefore served as a hub from where slaves were transported to the other islands to work the plantations. So we are going to cover a period now from the 1600s to the present. Robert S. Duplass, but something I must tell you, research into this history is so very interesting, exciting, amazing. And I would encourage everybody here when I do this, when I talk about these names, try to memorize, or we have um, block notes on our iPhones. <laughs> Robert S. Duplessis. He writes what did, about what did slaves wear and textile regimes in the French Caribbean. He says that the slaves arrived almost naked. And when Mr. Lawrence spoke about the economic value of our Creole wheel, that has been from time immemorial, since the slave trade, because the slaves ordered certain materials for their wheel. So from that time. The plantation owners were responsible for supplying their slaves with two outfits, one for weekdays, don't know when they got washed, and the other for Sundays and holidays. The women were given two short skirts or petticoats and large cassock, which is very, uh, it's large, yes, and long. And it's uh, also called a chemise. The men were supplied with culottes and chemise. The garments were made of inexpensive and coarse, dull, colored cloth, like hempen, linen, cotton basin, and jengas. Most often, the women slaves were seen topless. They were without their chemise in the heat. No doubt, this posed a serious challenge to the wives of the plantation <laughs> and the plantation owners, and certainly the church. And so the first dress was introduced for the women. And so the, what we call the toi tu was born. There we are. It's a simple garment made of the same coarse cloth as the previous outfits. And the dress was made with three holes, hence toi tu. One for the head and two for the arms, aptly named the Twatu. <laughs> I did a workshop in New Jersey and one of the children had to wear this dress. And she said to me, Auntie, I don't like these four holes. And she's right, there's one for the legs. <laughs> As we say, out of the mouth of babes comes the truth. And I had never thought of it before. <laughs> By 1690, the plantation owners stopped giving garments to their slaves. But that African spirit was there. It was undaunted. The slaves surprised the colonial masters and made every effort to ensure that on special occasions, that special occasion dresses became more and more dazzling as they took responsibility for it. They would not have been any more of this tour to thing. Médéric Louis Elie Moreau de Semeri implies that female slaves were gifted clothes by admirers and lovers. They also inherited clothes by the sweat of their brows because they had little portions of land that they would um, plant, they would um, cultivate. 
And when they sold it at the market, I think Mrs. Cordero um, gives reference to that as well. When they sold it at the market, they used the, the, the money they made to buy clothes. This hasn't changed, has it? We love dress. They added a brightly colored skirt. April. Right. They added a brightly colored skirt over the tuatsu and carried a length of cloth over the shoulders. They embellished their outfits with whatever nature offered, like beads, shells, bracelets, or rassad blanc. They're like stones, white stones, or items they could afford to buy. So men decorated their hats with gallads and the feathers. The Rosso Cultural Group named this outfit the Afriole in order to give it an identity. So when we were discussing what we were wearing for what performance, we knew the Afriole was that. Mrs. Cordero also talks about that in her article. Then we go on to the freed slave outfit. And there we have the jeep. Augustino Brunius, born in around 1730. He was a famous Italian painter who was brought to the island by Sir William Young of Fort Young. The name Fort Young was named after him. He gave us a good idea of the dress of the freed women of color through his paintings or social scenes of Dominica, St. Vincent, and Santo Domingo. A famous painting of his called The Linen Market was painted in Rosso, and you can actually identify and see that it's Rosso. Augustina Brunius died in, Do in Dominica on the 2nd of April in 1796 and was buried somewhere around the Rosso Cathedral area, according to Dr. Honeychurch. I am also told that the Bruni family may be his descendants. Now, it is worthy to note here that, the Dom that Dominica exchanged hands many times between the British and the French, and that Dominica, in terms of material culture, remained heavily French-influenced French even after its transfer to British rule in 1763. This French influence is evident up to today. The freed slave outfit, the freed slave outfit is, all right, we'll get to that. The freed slave outfit is said to have been influenced by the seniors of St. Louis, Senegal. These women were companions and wives to the French colonials until they returned to France. Actually, this story is quite sad because the, the French colonials came over to Senegal and they settled in St. Louis, where there was a nice river, the, the Senegambia River. And um, they, they, they kind of married these people, but when their term of office was over, they just left them and went back to France. Yes. I tell you, this research is very, very interesting. But we must read with... Um, open minds, yeah, and not reflect on the hardships, because if we reflect on the hardships, we're just going to be miserable. We look at the product now that we have. Look at our beautiful lady sitting there. <laughs> so the French colonial, they were said with the French colonials until they returned to France. They were well known as excellent hostesses, versed in the entertainment and care of the male gender and became rich traders. Their outfits, yes, there we are. Their outfits, as you can see, are quite elaborate, with several petticoats and well-fitting blouses. Robert S. Duplessis describes the headpieces as theatrical. And the headpieces, they're not made of madras. Madras had not arrived yet. They are made of sholay handkerchiefs, these handkerchiefs were originally made for men and were quickly taken over by the women for use as shawls and head ties. That's the same thing they did for the, the madras. Eh? The madras was originally intended for the white creoles, but the colored creoles took over. They did their head things. And again, an economic value, 
The Cholet factory is situated in the town of Cholet, Western France, saw momentous results in the sagging industry in the mid-1730s. Do we have another picture of the precis? Yeah, there, um, yeah, there we are. There's another one. You're going back, man. Okay. Now, research of photographs, videos. I mean, YouTube is a blessing. You get everything on YouTube, and I just love, that's what I spend most of my time doing, looking at the old photographs, looking at um, events that they have, as I say, connecting the dots. So videos and personal experience, like in Senegal and Benin, I went with my dear friend, Mrs. Ap 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 <laughs> And um, we went on a Francophonie conference to Bine. And there we saw all the, the, the goals and the things like that. And you, know, you can just see the connections. Thank you. <laughs> too, many, too numerous to mention. <laughs> so our, I feel our outfits, I can see the connection. I see our outfits are heavily influenced by the Francophone countries. With the passage of time, the layers of clothing of the freed women of color, which were the, um, the freed slaves, they had a lot of petticoats. They had about three or four petticoats and, um, to give them bulk. Yes. And um, yes, so the layers of clothing of the freed women of color became less in number, but by no means less attractive. Thomas Atwood, another name you have to remember, a British banker and economist. He was Chief Justice also on the island of Dominica from 1766 to 1773. In his book entitled The History of the Island of Dominica, describes Dominicans as being remarkably fond of dress for which they will spare no expense. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? We have not changed over the years. Lafcadio Hearn, an Anglo-Greek writer in his book, Two Years in the French West Indies, gives a very detailed description of the jeep outfits. They were luxu luxurious ones made of velvet and other expensive cloth with laces on the petticoats. So what our ancestors did, they used the best of both worlds. They exploited the laces and the fabrics of Europe, and together with their, that, that uh, who said DNA one day? You, just in a moment, somebody said DNA, you said DNA, right? And <clears throat> brought out that African streak, and they added the flamboyance to the jeep and the warp jet. And of course, Africa is known for its minerals. There's a lot of gold. So a lot of gold is very, very important with these outfits. The collier shoe. Yes, some of those here are collier shoes. Others are grendo. The collier shoe actually was particularly fashioned for the jeep. So um, some, some earrings and some necklaces were fashioned for the, the, like Martinique and Guadeloupe, the islands of the Caribbean. This outfit never failed to catch the attention of journalists who described them as sensational and exotic. Why don't we do the same? Yeah. Oh, the the Wab Duyet and the Jeep, they, look, at, look at our, our, our president. <laughs> Exotic, sensational, beautiful. The outfits were worn by the Belle Affranchis or the freed slaves and favorites of the plantation owners and rich merchants of Martinique. They were outfits of seduction and their Madras head ties were tied in many different ways indicating their social status. And this is where the three, one, two, three, four peaks come from. 
It was in an era when Martinique was in its heyday economically. Women wanted to be kept. That's, a, that's an age-old story. And, um, and so they dressed accordingly. They dressed very provocatively. And then they had these this head ties which told them that they were married or they were single or you could, you know, take a chance. Yes, exactly. So this, this is where it originates. As far as I know, the mean, I, as far as my research goes, I have not found those meanings in our headpieces. I know we use, always had the three peaks. And I remember one year, I had a photograph of it. Mrs. Cordero did, she, I mean, that was a big thing in tongue. She had sit up all night tying headpieces for the children of um, Wesley High School. And she used the two peaks. Now we come on to the warp duet. Have we shown them enough of the, um, the sheep? Here we have the bell, Miss Christian. <laughs> Look at how good, magnificent she looks. Which is the other one? This is a cousin of mine, Raisa Rule. And I want to show you this, this um, petticoat that is hanging. Actually, it is what we call the chemise de nuit. And this is what, the, this is what um, replaced the toitou. And uh, because night dresses before were heavily embroidered. They were beautiful. They, had, they were made of um, light linen or muslin, mus yeah, muslin. Um, and percal, very light. And my mother did that. She was about 85 or so when she did this embroidery for me because I wanted one. And when you wear this petticoat, so you have the top, you put another petticoat on top of the uh, top of the bottom half, another petticoat, and then you put on your skirt. And when you wear this outfit, you have two gold pins that stay here, and you do not wear a fuller. Baby Robinson, in the book that I wrote for the Cultural Division, there's a photograph of Mrs. Evadne Robinson, whom we all call Baby, and uh, she shows how that jeep, version of the jeep was worn. Here we have the traditional jeep. Any more in the jeep? And there we have beautiful ladies dressed in duet. And this, this one here is the dress that Sandra um, Charter wore when she became the first Miss Walk Duet. This is this very same dress, and her daughter is wearing it. Yeah. So, with the abolition of slavery on August the 1st, 1834, and subsequent decline in the economic activi activity on the plantations, the ship was replaced by the warp duet. Some say that was, it was due to the fact that the wearers of the ship got pneumonia and chest infections <laughs> because, because of the décolleté, the years. So this is another reason that they gave, but I really think it's due to the economic... Um, <laughs> decline. The Wab Duet was first seen in Martinique around 1859, according to the Martinican writer Rosalyn Buzz. This outfit, although not as luxurious as a jeep, but is by no means less impressive. It is certainly more regal in appearance and shares the stateliness and chic of the European, of the Edwardian period. You, the, the, back of, the back of the duet has very small pleats, it, uh, the, the, the small of the back, and it is really, and also the petticoat, when you wear the petticoat, all the gathers must be at the back. The front is plain or straight. So they want a straight front and a bow border. <laughs> so, it was complemented, no, the European fashion was complemented by the flamboyance of the African. The women of color created this outfit 
to make an upward niche for themselves as independent women and self-supporting women or married women on the echelons of society. The colors were well chosen to match the skin tone of the wearer. Now this is very important. Very, very important. So when I think about it, I mean, a lot of thought went into creating these outfits, the warp duet and the jeep, and particularly the warp duet. The fuller must contrast. I saw an article the other day saying that they should match. Now, when we say match, it means the colors must match. Sometimes you find that the um, people with the headpieces the same as a dress. No. We need to keep that color contrast. And as I always say, Miss Eugenia Charles, when I interviewed her many, many years ago, she was adamant that we must stick to color contrast. That is the character, the aura about the warp duet. Um, Lafcadio Hearn explains it as a contrast or a sharp relief a sharp relief to the dominant color of the warp duet. For example, if the dominant color of your warp duet is blue, you need to have a scarf with yellow, with yellow. <coughs> and I know that today we use a lot of plain satin, but in the olden days we used, we used, I am old, <laughs> we used, um, Colored scarves, and this is why I particularly showed those photographs, because I would just like to bring back the traditional of this one line. So you see, it, it contrasts. If you have white, then you have a white choice. But look at this one, you know? It's, it's made with plaid material, and the, she was able to get a scarf, white background, but with this, some of the colors of the dress on it. And look at her, beautiful. So we, we do not always have to use plain fabric. Lace, expensive cotton lace was used for the petticoats. And it can be made in a variety of styles. Now the, the petticoat for the jeep is different to that of the warp duet. And um, whereas the jeep, it's just, this is, okay. This I have, this is not the national dress, eh? <laughs> So it's a modern version, but it, it's just straight. And that is how the petticoat of the jeep is. The petticoat for the duet has a band across. It has a base petticoat. Then you take a, um, about twice or three times the, the width of the base of the petticoat, you gather it and you sew it on to the base from about the mid thigh. And I have worked with a lot of seamstresses to try and get them to do it and to make the difference. Now when you have on a petticoat, lace petticoats, Sometimes the, 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 the petticoat cost more than the dress because of the lace, the amount of lace that was put in it, sorry. A, lo a lot of lace that was put in. So you don't want to hide it. You want it to be seen. So when you are piche in your dress, I always have to leave because I have to give a demonstration. Then you reach to the back, and you gather from here, and you bring it, you do this, you bring it up, and your petticoat is supposed to show all around, all around. You want to show that beautiful lace petticoat, and you just hold it there, under your arm. So 
the duet has um, um, is made with a train tail or lachi. And to a comp and um, the duet made with a train tail or lachi as well, pitchy was well pitched to accomplish the objective of showing of the well-starched lace jipon. Gold jewelry, not as excessive as with the jeep, because the jeep was one of attraction, and then of course their, their, their lovers, should I say, bought them things, bought them jewelry. So, but it's still very much in evidence, in evidence of the head of the, was still much in evidence of, with the due date. A Madras head tie crafted from the collective memories of the African woman completes the outfit. Well put together, this outfit can be valued on the same level as any famous designer as yesterday and today, of yesterday and today. The wearer cannot pass unnoticed. And now we have the goal. I put those pictures. Can you have the one before? We have here Irene Felty. And you see her petticoat is being seen all around. This is Madidi. All these people lived in Cork Street and Field Lane where I was brought up. And this is the people who, whom I know. Irene Felty used to dress the bourgeoisie of Rosu including Mrs. Cordero. <laughs> Madidi, um, yeah, she was in Fields Lane, and you see she's wearing a, a, a patterned scarf, you know? And I have this here just to show that even in mourning, color contrast was very important. So I have a, a real purple violet, what color is that? With my black duet. And this was for my very dear friend, Marvlin Robinson, who was so brutally killed. And so we are on to the boss. This is from Senegal. And this is what the goal is all about. And what I want to show you as well is the head ties. Very similar to ours. You notice? So the goal was originally a dress of relaxation for the home. It is typically West African and worn mainly in the Francophone countries of that continent. Countries like Mali, Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire. And they produce the most elaborate and creative styles of gold using African cloth and lace. The islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe, and to a lesser extent, Dominica, use a variety of goals for home use. Today, we see the evolution of white goals trimmed with lace and worn for formal occasions. They are very elegant Creole outfits, always accompanied by gold jewelry, madras head ties. Uh, madras head ties are optional, you don't always have to wear it, but you comb your hair nicely back in a bun to look elegant, to look And of course, accompanied by head ties. I mean, sorry, jewelry, gold jewelry. So I hope by now, you are itching to make one of the traditional outfits to wear anytime, any place. Um, the, Javid, can we have the head ties? Okay, here we have some head ties. Yeah, I should be able to, okay. Yes, here we have the head ties. Can everybody see them? So this is a Tet Revolver. This is a Tet Cassie. Now, a lot of people refer to any head, head tie with Tet Cassie. But this is the Tet Cassie. My mother was born just at Bata State, La Coudoui, just with, with the lime plantation where they had this big white house. And she was able to see the workers when they came to work in tattered duets, informal duets, and on Sundays they were very well dressed. And of course, they tied their heads with the Tet Revolver. Oh, no, the Tet Cassie, 
for that's for semi-formal occasions. The TET revolver was more or less every day. But since we do not have these occasions, we, we don't have plantations as such, we can wear them when we want and with whatever we want, as long as we keep them alive. This here is the Tet Fosse, which is the traditional head tie for the jeep. Can we go back to that? Um, we had a picture of um, a Senegalese. Let's, let, let's go back and see if I, I just wanted to show. Yes. You see this peak, and there's another one. There's another one that I particularly wanted. No? Maybe we go further on. Okay. Josephine, let's go back to Josephine Lewis. Yes, she was the first runner-up of the Miss National Day competition. Yes, and this is the same dress that she wore in, from 67. Thank you. Okay, so yes, this, this, is, this is the goal. This is what the goal has evolved to now. Very elegant. Let's go. This is a Tet Piche and the or Tet Ale Calendi. And this is what we get mixed up with. They think this is a Tet Cassie, but it's not. When something is broken, it doesn't, it's not broken smooth like that. You have all kinds of shapes. So the other one is really the Tet Cassie. And this is a Tet Ale, Tet Piche, a lady in um, Point Michel. What did you say, blessed? Blessed memory, Yvonne Charles. She's the one who drew, who, well, there are three people actually. Yvonne Charles, Doris Joseph, and uh, Emmeline McCoy. Emmeline McCoy was from Grand Bay. Um, Joseph was, Doris Joseph was from Daly's, and Yvonne Charles from Point Mission. And each of them um, confirmed what the Ted Cassie was, so there's no mistake about that. So we have the Tet Ale or the Tet Piche. It is an art. It really is an art to do this. And um, it's painted before it is tied. You can, you can tie it just with a plain Madras square. But to get the Kalandi, they have specialists in Martinique called Kalandeurs. And they can, um, they do, we do it here too. And the Cultural Division organized a, a workshop which I coordinated. We had uh, Madame Yvonne Copo from Martinique who came, and we had somebody else before. You had somebody else before. And this really has an, an East Indian influence. It is not typically African. The influence of this is not African. Because in the 1800s, after the abolition of slavery, Martinique had to, in, had to have um, the invited indentured suits um, servants to come to work the fields as the, the fruit slaves no, wonder, no longer wanted to do that. So it is influenced by the East Indians who came to Martinique. What do we have next? Okay, so Mr. Lawrence, I have decided for the children, for the sake of the children, um, to change the meanings and I want to give them some positive adjectives as they're growing up. So I call them fey, leaves. And your fey, moi indépendant. Des fey, moi intelligent. Trois fey, moi créatif. Et quatre fey, moi fort. So I want the children to grow up with these positive adjectives because these things of I'm free no longer applies today. Let's go. And there we are, some more Senegalese women who are, and it's the head ties that I'm really want to show you and the girls at the back, there we are. And you see how they were used to their color? It's a pity they're not in, um, they're not colored photographs. What else do we have? Now we're talking about jewelry. Jewelry, very important part of the Creole outfit. And we have 
various um, various earrings and um, ch necklaces. Now there are some of them that which, who, which do not have names, but this one I know here is called the Tete Negress. It was fashioned on, you know, the rest. Um, this air, set of earrings here, very common in Dominica, but nobody can tell me the name for it. And this here is um, Zano Pierre Noir, and it was worn when people were in mourning. We have here necklaces, the grand door, which are little uh, balls, little round balls, the grand door. Um, this is what we call the Zanu, the famous Zanu Shini. This is Vigne, it's like a bunch of grapes. Zanu, Zanu Vigne, Zanu Pierre Vert, and of course the Tete Negris is here. This is a modern one, I don't think it has a name. There we have the necklace, which is the Fossa. And this one we have Collier Shoe and Grendo. And these are just other, other parts, um, other gold pieces that I have um, taken photographs of from various people. So this is very important. Ah, and now we go to the men. We have the jacket of the free slave which is what Mr. Lawrence was speaking about. So it's there. I don't think the men would wear the three-quarter pants, would they? <laughs> and there we are, the boss himself. <laughs> so he's there with his jacket. He's there with his chili. And this one, I presume you wear for funerals, the black and white. And look how handsome he looks. Why don't you all men want to wear it? Have we finished? Okay. So this comes to the end of my presentation. I would like to, however, just speak a little bit about the madras. Madras is a special type of fabric. It was made in India, but it was made with banana fibers. Of course, the British took it over and they, uh, they added cotton fibers but it was made with banana fibers. It is made, it is, um, the, the pattern is uniformed. Whatever pattern it is, it is uniformed. You can have a plain middle or the pattern comes through the middle. So when you are buying madras, be careful, or not be careful, but just be aware that if you want a plain piece in front, or do you want stripe in front? So, and because you, you fold it in a triangle, so you have to look and see how it is. They come in packs of eight, and each madras square has a demarcation line, and this is why it's so difficult to make a warp duet with it. They are making Madras-like patterns, which I think we, sh we refer to as plaid. And this you can use to make your shoots and your warp duets. It is easier to, to match. Whereas with the Madras squares, it's difficult. And the Madras they're producing now is so thin, I wouldn't even bother. It's not worth the effort. So ladies and gentlemen, End of my presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you, Madam. What an interesting presentation. I think we thoroughly enjoyed this one as well. Our final presenter for the evening is Mrs. Delia Coffee-Wicks. Mrs. Delia Coffee-Wicks has been an agricultural officer with the Division of Agriculture for 35 years. She is also a tutor for Creole courses at UE Global Campus. 
She completed her BSc Social Work in 2019 at UWE. Delia is a proud Grand Barian who grew up immersed in the cultural expressions of the island. She's a founding member at, of the Rosa Cultural Group and a member of the Committee Puetit Creole Kek. She has written a book of folk tales in Creole and English, T. Listwe Dominique, for the Cultural Division. Furthermore, Delia teaches people to tie traditional and modern Creole headpieces and has conducted workshops in that regard, both locally and overseas. In 2019, Yui awarded her the Alumni Award for Arts and Culture. Presenting this evening on the topic, Beyond October, Blending the National Wear into Contemporary Lifestyle, Mrs. Delia Coffee Wicks. Thank you, Madam Moderator, for your kind introduction. My fellow panelists, invited guests, all those who have joined us through some form of media, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be a panelist on the E.O. Libla Memorial Lecture. I want to preface my presentation by thanking God for keeping me alive up to this point that I can share my experience with you. I also want to thank UWE Open Campus, UWE Global Campus Dominica, and the Cultural Division for having this lecture every year so that we can touch, touch on issues that are of importance to us for national development. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As you know, I am Delia Coffee Weeks, and I have been asked to present on blending the national wear into contemporary lifestyles. Now, anybody who knows me knows this is right up my street. So I want you to join me on a journey so you will understand how it is that I have been able to blend the national wear into my daily life. You may be wondering, who really is Delia? I am a product of a number of things. I am a product of my environment. I was born in the culturally aware and vibrant community of Grand Bay. So as to whether I had a choice about being who I am, that is questionable. The older folk, if you were to ask them about my links within the Granby community, certain names would come up. One of them being my paternal grandmother, Marbotti, who was the village organizer. And Marbotti loved to wear a duet. So from a very early age, I learned to appreciate the beauty and the symbolism that is attached to our national wear. Then I moved to Roseau and I became one of the founding members of the Roseau Cultural Group, which at one time was the model for how people should really preserve their culture. Roseau Cultural Group did a lot of research. And yes, we are still there. Conservation, preservation of our culture, research, education, and we continue to do all that is necessary to ensure that people are sensitized and educated about what our cultural wear 
means. We also encourage people to make that distinction between your national wear and your traditional wear. Your national wear and the Creole wear. So now you know a little bit about me. Let's go on that journey. The journey of people adopting the national wear and wearing it in and out of season. Mabel Sissi Coderon, of blessed memory, was one of those who lamented the fact that Dominican women, for some strange reason, the majority of them did not want to wear the national wear. That was when she sang, Mwen ja plewe, mwen ja console mwen. Mwen ja plewe, mwen ja console mwen. Mwen ja plewe, mwen ja console mwen. Passe jen fam la, pavle pote duyet la. And in response, somebody answered, Pa plewe she mwen ke console ou. Pa plewe she mwen ke console ou. Pa plewe she mwen ke console ou. C'est pas pour qu'on prenne du duet la cadie à Dieu. So, I am one of those who's telling ma Coderon, don't cry. The national wear is not saying bye-bye. And if she were here with us now, she would realize that there is an upsurge in the interest of Dominicans wearing their national wear in the way that it is supposed to be worn. It has even spread outside of Dominica and the diasporic community sometimes are even more patriotic than us at home and they're having all kinds of shows. That is particularly important to teach the upcoming generation of Dominican parentage the beauty and the significance of our national wear. I am going to pose a question to you, especially you, the Dominican women. Do you know that there are two forms of national wear for women? If you didn't know, I am sure you listened to Auntie Aileen when she did her presentation, she told you that women's national wear was either the jeep or the duet. As you can see, I am wearing the jeep. Don't I look pretty? Of course. And you will admit that when a Dominican woman puts on her national wear, it makes her feel a particular way. It makes her feel like royalty. And I listened carefully a few days ago when Dr. Joseph was introducing the book launch of Miss Burton. And she spoke about how you feel when you put on your national wear, how she feels. And I will also tell you how I feel when we wear our national wear. You feel that you cannot slouch. You have to stand up. You have to have your back straight. You have to present yourself. And you feel beautiful. And because you feel that way, then it's very easy for you to carry yourself and command that respect that everybody just has to stop and to look at you. Jean Lawrence Mathurin captures that beautifully in that song of hers. I am no great singer, 
but I will just tell you a little bit of what Jin sang. Jin sang, Uvwed we et salai bel, Esu worship lai bel, Wob kwe ol sala se sanu, Tut fam dom ni chen, Tut fi dom ni chen, Si pose ni la wob nacional. Do you, as a Dominican woman, own either the jeep or the duet? Some of you are answering no, sadly. But there is hope. Our future is bright. Because I'm hoping that after tonight's presentation, you will do what is necessary so when this time comes around next year, then you can proudly answer yes. So, me and my journey with that national wear. I have gotten so comfortable with wearing my national wear that I feel I need to have it with me all the time. So when I travel out of state, you can make sure I have some form of national wear, just in case the occasion should arise. Now, Rosso Cultural Group had some lovely outfits. And I know we were the envy of many groups because we had done the research, so we knew of the different color clashes, and how to put things together so that we created a lovely picture when we appeared in public. And just based on the way that I felt when I dressed up to perform with Rosso Cultural Group, when I remember Maboti, my grandmother, and how proud she stood in her duet, I developed that love, that appreciation for the duet. I remember when I traveled to Trinidad in 1984 to study. I traveled with my national wear. And I got the opportunity to be on stage at an Indian festival. But there was I, a little bit of a Dominican girl wearing her national wear and being an ambassador for her country. So people know that Rosso Cultural Group, we perform in and out of season. So when I started wearing my national wear outside of what people consider the Creole season, people would ask me, where are you performing today? And I would tell them, we're not performing anywhere. I'm wearing my clothes. I'm going to church. And for me, one of the things is that any time I got an invitation to a function and it said formal or semi-formal wear, for me, that was an occasion to wear either my national wear or some form of traditional Creole wear. The duet, the jeep, sometimes I couldn't make up my mind which one to wear, but I love wearing both of them. One of the things I would like people to understand is that when you put on your national wear, you are no longer you that individual, you are now an ambassador to your country. You represent the beauty of white Tukupuli, of Dominica. So Delia continued wearing her national wear to different functions, to church, to weddings, to parties. And as I mentioned wedding, Madam Moderator, if memory serves me right, I think 
your wedding was a totally cruel affair. I think I saw photographs and the bridesmaids were in shape and the thing looked so beautiful. I have gone to funerals and depending on the person who is being celebrated, I feel they deserve more than just the ordinary funeral attire. And so, I have my traditional wear, my national wear in different colors. That is one of the things people need to remember. It doesn't have to be all bright because life is not always sunshine and roses. And even when you're in a very somber mood, maybe because you're in mourning, you can still wear your national wear and look quite dashing, if I may say so myself. People are very comfortable wearing other people's clothes more than they are in wearing their own clothes. I see many people going to weddings and parties in all sorts of African wear. It is nice. It is pretty. But if you were so comfortable wearing African wear, you're not African, remember that. You are Dominican. You are Creole. It is high time that we stop thinking of our national wear as a costume. It is not a costume. These are our clothes. I feel very comfortable after I leave here to take a stroll down the street. I am wearing my clothes. I am properly dressed. And people got to that point when they realized, oh, Mrs. Wicks, Mrs. Wicks just loves wearing her national wear. So we expect to see her wearing it at any time. So they stopped asking me where I was performing. And it even reached a point where certain people only expect to see me in national wear at certain functions. And so sometimes I throw a spoke in their wheel and people are like, how come is that you're wearing? And I said, I just want it to be different because I do not always want to live up to your expectations. When you wear your national wear, you are an ambassador to your country, whether you're in Dominica or not. So you actually have to know the different components of your outfit and if there is something that is signified by any part, you need to know that. So for example, my outfit consists of my headpiece, my fula, my chemise dentelle, or my creole top, my colorful skirt, and my lace petticoat underneath. I am completely dressed because I have on my black shoes and, of course, I accessorized properly with gold to show what I've worked for. My gold, my gold, whether it's real or fake, it makes a very good impression. Are you so comfortable? with your national wear, that you can wear it anywhere, anytime, and be able to tell people about it. I don't know about you, but I certainly am. Sometimes I think we do not even see or appreciate the wow factor that our national wear takes along with it. 
I have experienced this on a number of occasions where for whatever reason people may be asked to wear something that would tell you something about where they're from and every single time that the Dominican national wear is front stage and center people are like wow I love that I can evoke that sort of expression from people. And I revel in it, which is why I love to wear my national wear, whether I'm at home or abroad. I am also very comfortable with the fact that once people are willing to listen, I am ready and able to educate. As I speak about educating, it is a little bit sad that at this time of year, there are a few people that the schools call on to come to teach their children. We are all Dominican nationals. And we need to know enough that we can do the education. It is not that Auntie Eileen or Mr. Lawrence would say no, but they have other things to do. Sometimes I have to say no because there is only one of me. But it hurts when I know for whatever reason I have to deny children the experience of hearing from somebody, not somebody who is paid to speak about it, but somebody who is passionate about it. We need to embrace our national wear. Remember, we are Dominicans 365 days a year. And so our national wear is ours, 365 days a year. We also have to know our culture and put it on par with some of the other cultures that we are embracing. We can embrace other cultures, but not by putting them above ours. That is not patriotic. So, now you know, Mrs. Wicks loves her national wear. Because of that, I have invested in a number of the different ones. Remember the different components I spoke about? You don't have to get everything one time. You can get the blouse this month. You can get the skirt a couple months later. You can buy the material for the petticoat, buy the cotton one time, buy the lace another time. Always be on the lookout. And you also have to cultivate an eye for things that will look good. Looking at the florals, the stripes, the different things that will make statements. Do not only have your national wear in bright, bold colors. You may need to wear your national wear when you're not feeling so bright. Make sure you can interchange. I have done it. And so can you. I am so very happy to have had the opportunity to share my experience with you. I am willing to advise people, to tell them how to go about it. I am encouraging people to learn to tie the different headpieces. Because even that you can do. You can buy different colored squares. You can try tying different patterns. You can be very creative. 
And once you feel very happy, very pretty when you're wearing those creations, you are well on your way. My caution to you though, don't mix apples with oranges. Be able to make that distinction between your national wear and your Creole wear. Your national wear is in fact Creole wear, but not all Creole wear is the national wear. I am at the point where I can wear any form of the national wear to any function I have met people who have said to me, you look so lovely in this, but I don't know if I'm brave enough to wear this outside of the independence season. And I am like, this is rubbish. There is nothing to it. Just put on your clothes and feel pretty. I have also met people at different functions who applaud me for wearing my national wear and who lament that they never even thought about it. I am urging you, get to that point. Wear your national wear. You can maybe begin by going to church with it sometimes. And if somebody says to you, what happened in Creole season? Tell them no, it's another day in Dominica. I am Dominican, are you? Of course I am. I love it. And everybody knows that I love it because I show it. So I'm encouraging you. I am still on that journey. I am still looking to have other outfits so I can express myself, so I can be that beautiful Dominican belle that one that the people sang, Afidom Nixala. This is a presentation, it's not sing I'm supposed to be singing to you. And I need a few other people to join me. Depending on what it is that you do, you can make adaptations for your daily life. So I have versions of the duet short sleeve, no sleeve. They're not the proper duet, but they're appropriate for what I wear them for. What you need to know is that whatever adjustment that you make, be able to educate and to explain. So, I am on that journey, but my journey is far from over. Because when I walk, in places where I see fabric, they call my name. And when they call my name and I respond, I'm like, okay, this is my next duet. Oh boy, that will make a lovely jeep or a gull or whatever. So I am encouraging you. I'm actually inviting you to come join me on that journey. Let me see more Dominican bells walking on the street, in and out of season, 365 days a year, wearing our national wear with pride, wearing it properly. I'm actually going to be looking out for the military parade when the invitation says national wear. And if they would just give me a chance, I would block a lot of people from entering the Windsor Park if they're not properly dressed. But you have a pass and I have placed you on notice. So it is time to do things right. Let us know our national wear. Let us appreciate our national wear and let us wear it with the pride that it deserves and let us look pretty doing it. Dominique Bell family, you don't agree with me? Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your time and attention.
Yeah, it's that was a great presentation. It's not easy to keep a captive audience by a video. And Delia managed to do that tonight. Great, great stuff. And um, she wants to be the police, our national wear police at the Independence Parade. Madam President, take note. <laughs> Delia is offering these services for free. And I second that because I've always been saying on the 3rd of November, we should all try to wear the authentic national. The world is watching. It's free promotion of our national wear. And yes, we have three months to do the Creole Fridays and be, you know, creative. But on the 3rd of November is the real deal. Should be the real deal. And I like her style. She said you don't have to buy everything one time. Buy the material this month, next month we buy the list. The other, you know, great stuff. Good, 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 good stuff. And I think we should take it on. So we've come to that part of the program where we want to hear from you. You've heard from us. We need to hear from you. And it's an open um, floor. It's an open discussion. And I'm sure you have something to see. And we would love to hear from you, of course. We really had a great audience here tonight. The audience, give yourself a round of applause. Very appreciative crowd. Wow. So I have the microphone. If you'd like to say something to one of the presenters, you are more than welcome to just raise your hand and I will come to you where you are. Anyone has anything they would like to say or ask? You're all gone shy now? <laughs> really? Hold. Good evening, everybody. Um, <laughs> um, for Mr. Lawrence, I think, I was curious as to what right now is gazetted as our national wear? Hello. Just, yeah, from what I recall, um, because I remember once I was on the radio and then afterwards, President Shaw, <laughs> but I was speaking about national wear. So he said there was an act that was passed. I think it was while well, Patrick John was still um, Prime Minister that there was a dress, national dress act, but it only referred to, to men, not the ladies. And it's, 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 it wasn't anything to do with the cruel way that we have. It's the shirt jack that was, and still is in law. Um, and Eugenia Charles even protested, I understand, the fact that there were no, the women were not included, and she came in a, in a swimsuit from what I hear. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that is why today we are trying to see through... <laughs> emblems committee to see if we can get the the national wear as we know it now recognized and approved by cabinet thank you anyone else no, not follow. Uh, in terms of, I'm an advocate for getting everybody to where they will be um, educating. Um, I learned under Mrs. Weeks and Ms. Burton. Anyway, the cost, some people, the cost, in my opinion, I saw. The core jipo, I think, is making the Wobdue more expensive. Now that I would think that with the progression of time, I mean, the core jeeper was supposed to be what they would, uh, uh, the bra part, the bra. Now that everybody has bra, that if they maybe would make the work do it without the core jeeper, that would maybe make it a little cheaper for people to wear. 
Ms. Burton, what do you have to say about that? About the cost and about um, some um, modifications? Um, Delia gave a very good system of, or, or, or method of um, acquiring the warp do you doing it bit by bit. That is possible. Now, I know the Cojupon did take place, uh, the place of a bra, before bras were invented. But where in the warp do you the, the, the lining, which is what we call the Cojupon, is um, it's very practical because we're in a hot country and we sweat. And if we did not have this lining, actually the Cojupon is just what's in front, eh? But the whole, uh, the, the, the top of the duet should be lined. And um, it, it, it's, it's really practical because it absorbs the sweat. If not, that dress is going to stick on you and it's not going to look nice. And when you start it, the starch will just um, melt and, you know, it will just look horrible. Now, I'll tell you something. You saw me with this um, black duet to attend my friend's funeral. And when I first put it on, I said, Lord have mercy, I'm going to stifle. But after a while, the white, you know, I, I was fine. I, was, I didn't get hot. I didn't perspire. Everything was fine. So there's a reason why this thing is there. Because the lining does not take, place of, um, take the place of the bra, you know. It's just the quasi point front. So the, the lining is very particular. And it's very important. And all you have to do is just buy a little extra half a yard to make the Porsche boy in front. You know, I think, it's, I think it's, it's necessary, and I would not advise anybody to make the warp do it without lining the top and the Porsche No, Now, Miss Aileen, I have a question of my own. Well, I am a, a warp person. I own many. But I have reached a point where I have to say no to people who want to Learn it, borrow it, whatever the it is. Um, like Delia, it is my investment, yes? I give it to my, I plan for the year. I know, like I know I'm doing a white this year, and I knew that since January, you know? I know what I'm doing because it's my thing. And I, I plan for it, I invest in it, I buy it in pieces, I don't wait until independence time. Mine should have been ready already, Domlek. But, you know, I, I plan in advance. And so, um, you know, people see, like, like Dila has experience, and I know you have, and I know that the late um, Violin, uh, her brother is here, used to talk about that too, that people will see you showcasing and so on, and they want to learn, they want to borrow, they want to try, they want to, but, but they don't understand. I wouldn't ask you to use your computer, I wouldn't ask you to, use, to take your phone, or those kind of things that you're investing in. Um, so I think that if people like it, they should invest in it. Um, I, I agree with Delia that, that it is something that you can buy piece by piece and whatever. But, but it is something that you should, if you want to be a farm quail, it's not cheap, you know. Um, as to whether it should be as expensive as it is, <laughs> I don't know. But, but the thing is, and, and the, but the seamstresses are here and they can say the kind of labor and how labor intensive it is. But I really believe that, you know, that people, if you, if you like it, we should make an investment in at least in at least one. So I want to hear you and Raymond, you know, your opinion about about that and the investment. Oh, um, just now, um, I quite agree with you. I think when you have made an investment, it is not something you're going to just lend out because the dress is very expensive, very very expensive. So. Um, not to sound selfish, but to protect your investment, I would not advise you lending out. Now, it's something else people don't understand. You do not have to have 10 duets. You do not have to have 10 petticoats. If you like it and you can afford it, fair enough. But if you can't, all you have to do is to preserve it, wash it when your, the season is finished, do not put bleach in it, for God's sake. Um, do not dry it in the sun, dry it in the shade on a breezy day, and pack it away. I think, Mrs. Agpa, would you like to tell them about... You just left. What a pity. Okay. Mrs. Agpa is married to someone from the Côte d'Ivoire, and she goes there often. 
And there is um, a rule or a, a tradition where the particular fabric used for special occasions, they are kept at the home of a senior person. And when an occasion arises, they come and they borrow. They take it and they bring it back. <laughs> no, so everything is stored there. Why can't we, we it's preserved. Yeah, so why can't we do that with our work? Do yet? Have it at granny's home or mommy's home. And something else I will tell you. When we were growing up, our petticoats had big pleats, the top of the petticoat. If you had lace at the bottom, the top of the petticoat had pleats. So as you grow a year older, you let down a pleat. And that's, yes, it's a very practical thing. And that saves you buying a petticoat every year. Wow. So you make it large, but you put pleats on top. So every year, you just let it down. And you don't need 10 petticoats and you don't need 10 duets unless you particularly like them. That's just what I was going to say. It's not something like ordinary dresses where you buy it so often. It lasts, it can last you for years. So, I mean, if you have worn this year, you can have it for five years, so it's not that expensive. So that's just what Aileen has just said. Yeah. Um, I just want to say the, the presentations tonight were very um, inspiring and educational. Um, my cons, my something that came up to mind is um, I'm when I like the contemporary wear, the Creole wear. I'm proud to say I do own a, a duet, but I really like you know the contemporary wear. And um, I what I notice is. Most young women, they give more um, attention, you know, to that kind of thing. But I'm asking, if we go out to represent our country concerning maybe our warb and our what, what amount of um, value does the contemporary wear take to, a, to the real warb? Um, my other question is, like, for example, when we talk about the Creole wear for women, the Creole wear, women tend to wear the Creole wear for men. And um, that sometimes is something that can be, you know, really, you know, buggling. Everybody has their opinion on that. And I think that when we are looking at the warb as the Creole wear, as a woman, you, you know, you present it like that and... Any other thing is optional. What is contemporary wear? What is Creole wear? Okay, I'm wearing something that is based on the traditional, but it is not completely traditional. But it is Creole. And if I go anywhere, somebody is going to ask me, where are you from? I'm sure. Just because I have a petticoat, that is shown. Creole dress is what? Lace, plaid, the style. It's a combination of things. So you can use any fabric and make it the, the, the style of the warp duet. Or you can use a peasant blouse with an ordinary skirt. I saw a girl walking down the street, yes, two days ago. Very, very simple. She just had on a white skirt and a large white blouse, and her head was tied in a madras, and she had some, uh, a necklace. She looked so beautiful. It wasn't expensive. It's something that she had at home, and she tied her head, and she just looked Creole, you know? So you don't have to, People think the louder, the better, but sometimes the simplest thing with just a touch of madras or a touch of gold, the earrings, you become Creole right away. So I don't think it's a, it's, um, a big effort, you know? And then if people ask you, you just say, that's Creole wear, you know? That's, it's not my traditional wear, it's not my national wear. Because what tourists like to do, they come, and even Dominicans who are unaware, 
they come the, 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 for the parade and they just take a mass of people, Dominica's national wear. And people are wearing anything, you know? So I don't know how, we, we, we cannot guard against that because this is the way of the world. But um, yes, we just have to be careful between Creole wear, I'm wearing Creole wear, and it is not my tradition, it's not my national dress, but it's Creole wear. Madam Moderator, can you allow three more? Yes, three more. Uh, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to tie up a little bit of all of the things said. Because, for example, in schools, you would try to encourage the students to wear the national way. But each year they want to be different. So that's where, you know, each year they're going to spend to buy, to make something creative. Okay. And so I said to them, you know, the national wear, yes, is expensive, but it will last you for a very long time. So even when you spoke about at the back, you know, you let off and you let off. So you're young. Oh. So they're right. So in other words, you get bigger and it can still fit you. Then, of course, even as the um, pleats on the, the, skirt, on the petticoat, it makes it look pretty from a distance. Somebody doesn't really see it's not laced there, but it's serving a purpose next year. You put down a piece and so on. So it is that sometimes you look at the expense. Well, I'm talking for the young persons at school. And they talk about the creativity. So, you know, we look at the Creole wear and we want the contemporary. But even when we had the national parade, the um, parade on Creole Day, it used to be just the national wear because at school they would say to you, all those in national wear, you will go out to the parade. Now I'm seeing any and everybody on the road in creative wear, in contemporary wear. So. Good evening, everybody. I actually have two questions. The first one is, um, I think it's similar to what the um, respondent before me said. It's the law. What are we doing? You know, at the end of the day, us, as, especially as Caribbean people, we are more, we are very, very attracted to contemporary, to things United States, United Kingdom, Canada, as well as things modern. What are we as the authority doing? What are we doing in schools to help it? If you set a rule as a principal and say, on that day you wear your what do it? Or you come in your school clothes. I remember I know my son goes to a particular school. And that principal, she's no she's no longer the principal. I'm not saying her name, but everybody should know who she is. She will tell the parents, please send your child to school in the um, national wear. If not, let that child come in the school uniform. And she said that. She's no longer the principal, but I remember when my son started there, that principal of that particular secondary school would say, it. so what are we as authority? What are we as bosses in our workplaces? What are we as bosses? our boss is doing? What are we as the cultural division doing when we say that we have a week for African wear and we know it's independent season? African wear is in June, July? That's May? Yes. African dress day is that day. Why are we adding different things to our independent season? We are actually encouraging other people to do it. So what are we as authorities doing? And that is the same, and I'm asking that in Another question, what are we as authorities doing to market our independence, um, our national way as Dominica own? And I'm not ashamed to say it, I'm not afraid to say it, because I've seen them in, at CARICOM meetings, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, these countries, these countries are coming and saying, this is their national way now, and we know it's our own. What are we as the Dominican authorities what are we as, as, Dom, as the Dominican authority? I'm hearing um, Mr. Lawrence is saying that it's not even gazetted as yet in our, it's not even gazetted as yet. So what are we as authorities doing to bring it out there internationally? You know, we have the World Korean Music Festival, all these different things. What are we doing? What are we as the leaders, what are we as the heads doing to ensure that this remains? Thank you. 
I just wanted to commend Mr. Lawrence and Ms. Burton and Mrs. Weeks for continuing to try to get us to understand what a national wear, et cetera, is. This year, I, well, I always thought that I had a correct jeep. <laughs> oh my God. No, 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 not the jeep, the jeepo. I got the correct name. So it's the petticoats. So when I came to Miss Burton's book launching the other day, she spoke to the wob and the jeep having two different jeepos. And there I am, I bought her book immediately and read feverishly, and I'm having my jeepos made. However, I must say <laughs> that <laughs> the person who is making it for me is describing the process. And I am saying it is not an easy process. And if you really have to get the authentic ones, it really does take a lot from the seamstresses and so on. And the person making it for me says every time, you know, she calls Miss Burton and she says, add this, do this, do that. So I know that it will be authentic. I want to thank them for that kind of knowledge. And for those of us who can um, invest in it, we should. I also want to thank Miss Burton, Miss Pearl, Akpa, for also showing us the Creole wear, because I think that the Creole wears, and Miss Wick spoke, Mrs. Wick spoke about it, the shortened this, this. I just think that if they, if you've gotten an invitation and it says the national wear, you should have your jeep or your wob. However, I think that our creativity as Creole women come out in things like this, and I love them just as much. So to me, we are not shortchanging ourselves in any way, in my opinion, to have both of the things, to make sure that we know what our national wear is, and to also be able to tweak things and be very Creole. For example, I think on Creole Day, it is such a beautiful display of Creole wear that we shouldn't hold that against them. I do agree that if there's something for national, for our traditional, that we should say, if you don't have it, you can't. But for Creole Day, I love everything about this and the things that I also make and what I see pearl wearing and so on. So I just want to say thank you again for explaining to us, for illustrating by your own examples, and to keeping it alive. I'm excited now. You know, before people just say the warb is boring, the this and that, now I am so even more excited after um, Aileen's two books and, and all of these forums that I want to have, and those of us who can afford, I had my warp since 2008, and it was still, I wore my warp until last year. I'm only investing in another one this year, but I could have still continued to wear my same one. My daughter says, I'm taking your one, mommy. I still love it. So it's just passing on to another generation, and I'm making another one. But thank you so much. Good evening. I just wanted to applaud the efforts of the cultural division because especially in their use of social media, Facebook, YouTube, because that's what the young people use. And over the past week, they've been displaying all of the different forms of the national will, label it properly so you know all of the different parts. And that, I think, is very good. There's some videos with Mrs. Wicks tie in the head and I, I've actually I made it my hobby to practice the different head pieces so that's good and um, one thing I wanted to to a question for Miss Miss Burton we've seen the um, emergence of the African styles especially in the men so the shirts with a piece here and a piece there and a piece there and a piece there so I just wanted her comment on that Um, we can only, we cannot command and we cannot insist that people wear certain things. Um, if they used the, the plaid, the madras looking plaid on the shirts, I find that it's fine. And, and they can make um, 
creative styles with that. I think this is very nice. But I... Um, Colleen. <laughs> I, yeah, I would just like to respond to Colleen. I, the, she says it's the Creole dress parade. Is it the national dress parade that we have? Raymond? You turned on the national day, which I, you know, I tend to agree with you a little bit, because as you saw here, um, the, 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 the slides that I showed, or the pictures that I showed, we have a variety of Creole dresses born on the island from the 1600s to now, okay? So we have the Tuatu, we have the, the, the Afriol, we have the Gaul, we have the Jeep, the Duet, and the Free Sleeve Outfit. And as she is saying, it, looks, it would look beautiful if we, could wear sec if we could have sections in the different outfits. I did that with the, in 1993 when, we were, when I prepared for the Quincentennial Year. I did the, um, organize or coordinated all the activities. And this is something that I got Rosa Cultural Group to do. We had a, a, a wagon made from two wheels for, we got from Hillsborough. We filled it with cane. And then we had children in Tuatu, children in, in little girls. Then the, the free slave outfit, the girls and things like that. And the jeep, they do it. And I, I am just wondering whether this would assist or would it help in people wearing what they can afford and leaving the dwarf do it for special occasions. I don't know. It, it's just something that needs to be debated. But we have the, the, the contestants of the Miss Warp Duet show. They can wear it. They can lead the parade. And then if mothers cannot afford a duet for that year, they can make the tour too. You know? It's food for thought. And I think it would be so much more interesting because one of the years I had a few um, girls with me and then we had placards saying this is the Afriol, this is the goal, this thing. So educating people at the same time, you know. But this is food for thought, Mr. Matthew. <laughs> and there's a question um, for Mr. Lawrence. I don't know if he has an answer for that. No, but somebody was just asking me, is there any plan to seek... Um, funding from UNESCO in terms of um, the preservation of Dominica's national dress? Has there been any work in that regard? Thanks a lot for putting me on the spot. Um, UNESCO generally offers um, avenues for funding. There's the, the intangible cultural heritage program that's going on now, and that would include things like the national wear. So, yeah. I just wanted to make a general comment because of what I mentioned in what I said, that in all cultures, there's contemporary and traditional. You go to any part of the world, Africa, they have all the modern outfits, but they have all their traditional outfits still. They have all the modern buildings. Africa have a lot of high skyscrapers, and more, but they have all the traditional the pyramids and all of that and things that they preserved from hundreds of years ago. Museums that they... That is what culture is about. It's about contempt. That's what's, and that is what sometimes we don't understand. We, we, we don't quite understand, it's not either or. We, we, go, we don't want traditional again, we go in contempt, no. We don't want contemporary, we, we want full traditional, no. It is not either or, it is both. B contemporary, traditional, in culture, everything is moving forward. You're still progressing, you're still developing, but you're taking the rich aspects of your traditions with you. You don't leave them behind. And the, there will always be a trend towards contemporary in, in everything. I mentioned it in every aspect. I, I spoke about modern medicine, tradition. In every aspect, there's the contemporary pull. There's the 
So you, 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 you are encourage the contemporary, the creative. There will always be that aspect of it. But at the same time, you try to preserve your beautiful traditional aspects. It's not either or. It is both contemporary and traditional. So we're not saying you cannot wear it for people who feel, more. Oh, I, I like my contemporary. Yes, that, that's fine. But we are saying, why can't you also have? That's the point. Yeah. That's the, even if it's one you have, that's fine. You don't have to wear it all the time. You can wear your contemporary 20 times. But on that special occasion, you decide, let me put on my duet. And that's the point of the thing. It's not one making the other one extinct. We want to kill you. We want to destroy you. We don't want you again. Come out there. No. It is the both. Uh, that is what makes a culture beautiful. That you have the contemporary and you have all the traditionals. If I want to see a ballet, I want to see a ballet. If I want to hear Jinping music, I should be able to hear it still. Apart from the, the Triple K and the Signal Bands, which are great, beautiful music. But if I want to hear Jinping band, I should... It's sadly in Guadeloupe, when we went some years ago, I can't remember if Mikhail was there, I brought up that example already. The folk dances in Guadeloupe, like what we have, quadrant, all the Jinping bands, I'm not sure what they call them up there, folk bands, all the people who used to play have died. They have none of those bands anymore. When we came, they were those people shocked to see we have Jinping band. I was surprised. I said, but was a big shock that they couldn't understand how we still have that traditional aspect very much alive. And that's because Dominica has taken, invested, promoted both contemporary and traditional, and that's why the, the heritage is so rich. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your active participation in this evening's timely and informative 10th edition of the E.O. Libla Lecture Series. We are at that point where I must inform you that my tour of duty is over here. <laughs> and so I gracefully hand over to Dr. Keyboard Joseph. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Banish Roberts, thank you so much for a job well done as moderator. Thank you. And I really wish to thank Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Burton, and Mrs. Weeks for their wonderful, wonderful presentations this evening. But to give the official vote of thanks is Ms. Annalene Joseph, who is the chair of Dominica's Guild of Students of the UWI Global Campus. I now welcome Annalene to give the vote of thanks. Good night, everyone. Your Excellency, Mrs. Silvani Burton, President of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Mr. Gilbert Burton, Dr. Kimun Joseph, Head of the UE Global Campus and Staff of the UE Global Campus, Mr. Olson Matthew, Chief Cultural Officer, Division of Culture and Staff of the Cultural Division, Monsignor Eustace Thomas, Priest, Our Lady of Fair Haven Parish, Haven Parish, sorry, Audience members in the auditorium and those joining us live via DBS radio and live streaming platforms, media representatives, good evening to all. I am honored to give the vote of thanks this evening on behalf of the Guild of Students of the UE Global Campus, Dominica. To begin, we give thanks to God, our Father Almighty, who has allowed us to be here on this occasion. We thank him for our beautiful country and its rich culture that we can explore and enjoy. We are also grateful for the presence of their excellencies at this event. I am happy to be able to note that this is one of the first activities that they are attending since the inauguration. And we are delighted that it is with UWE. Madam President and Mr. Burton, we look forward to many other occasions with you in the near future. Our thanks go to Dr. Kimon Joseph, who served as chair and also gave the welcome remarks this evening. In addition, we show our appreciation to Ms. Tasha Peltier, cultural officer who led the national anthem, as well as to Monsignor Thomas, who invited the Lord's presence through the opening prayer. I wish to thank Mr. Olson Matthew, chief cultural officer, for his collaborator's remarks. Mr. Matthew, 
I take this opportunity to renew UWI's commitment to working with the Division of Culture on this and other projects. We have been working well together, and they, as they say, why stop a good thing? In addition, I thank my comrade, Ms. Keisha Polido, who introduced our moderator for this evening's proceedings. To our efficient moderator, Mrs. Lauren Barnes roberts I offer special thanks. You did a wonderful job ensuring that the event was well managed, and we are most grateful. Our esteemed panelists, Mr. Raymond Lawrence, Ms. Aileen Burton, and Mrs. Delia Coffey Weeks, what wonderful presentations. You each manage your subtopics well, and your points were clear and well organized. Your love of our national dress and other aspects of Dominica's culture are truly evident. In addition to those on the program, there was a lot of work that took place behind the scenes to make this evening possible. And so with your permission, we would like to offer gratitude to the staff of UWE who prepared the programs, wrote the letters, made the calls, and prepared the room for us. Moreover, we thank our team of technicians, Mr. Javed Seaman, Mr. Lyndon Lestrad, and the DBS technical team for all their hard work. DBS has provided the light broadcast gratis to UE, and we are so thankful to that. To Mr. Cecil Joseph and the manager and his entire staff who have come on board and stood in the gap for UE time and time and again, we say thank you. We are also grateful for the assistance of Mr. Darren Liebla for both the videography of Mrs. Week's presentation and the photography of this evening. I must say a special thank you to Mrs. Patricia Kid Coffey who stepped in to assist with the Creole head tying for this evening. That service is usually provided by Mrs. Weeks, but Miss Kate graciously assisted in her absence and we are glad. And to you, our wonderful audience, both in the auditorium and those participating via live media, I offer our sincerest thanks. You are our students, alumni, and friends. Many of you participate in UE events throughout the year, and we appreciate you. Please join us for our next scheduled event, which will be the Dame Eugenia Charles Memorial Lecture on Wednesday, 13 December 2023. Our presenter will be Dr. Nico Philip Dow of Grenada, who will present on the topic, Is Freedom We Making? Lessons from the Grenadian Revolution, 1979 to 1983. I wish you all a very good night and a safe journey home. Thank you. And it's the job of the chair to thank the person who gave the vote of thanks. So Adeline, thank you very much. I do have some brief announcements. Firstly, Miss Aileen Burton has some of her books, that, of the children's books that she wrote. So if you miss the opportunity to get one at her launch, you can purchase one today. Also, our photographer wishes to take photos of all you lovely people. So after I have gone out with their excellencies, if you wish to stay for Darren to take some lovely photos with you, we'd be very grateful. And thirdly, the headpieces that ladies are wearing that were tied by Miss Kate, they belong to UWI and so I'd like them back. So take all your photos with Darren and then give me my, my things back. Please, thank you. All right. So I invite you all now to stand as um, the excellencies depart and then you can stay for all your lovely photos with Darren. I will come back and join you for those photos as well. So, Excellencies, thank you so much for being here.